Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and today I'm honored to introduce to you satanic and Masonic ritual abuse and mind control survivor and whistleblower, YouTube and content creator, first generational New Zealander, credentialed counselor with a specialization in narrative therapy, communication skill, small group training course facilitator, traditional herbal medicine advocate, retreat co-facilitator, and healing warrior, Poppy Joy. Poppy is a satanic and Masonic ritual abuse survivor who was born into a multi-generational incest-based family and has recently been liberated from an immense amount of trauma that her body was struggling to contain anymore. Her memory started to surface in 2017 from a few triggers in her surroundings, including a vicious semi-wild dog on the loose, a jellyfish sting that gave her a histamine reaction where her whole body was covered in a rash, and swollen lips and other orifices. In Poppy's shock state of remembering what she was programmed to forget, her then partner encouraged her to keep breathing through what she was experiencing, and scenes, smells, visions, and sound memories started to flood her conscious mind. They were disorganized and chaotic, but over time, Poppy started to connect the dots. Poppy's earliest memories were related to her senses. She remembered that her eyesight and hearing never developed normally and her per perceptions have been energetic, meaning that she can observe the movement of energy, experience telepathy, and with focus can see how black magic practices are done. Poppy discovered that rituals are done to empower government legislation. She found how consciousnesses are connected to calendars and astrological systems and that rituals are performed with dates and planetary alignments. Poppy is super sensitive to cults and dangerous religions, but did not become that way without having many dangerous experiences with them. Church and spiritual abuse had tainted her concepts of Father God and her Mayan connection and intuitive interactions with it brought her to know the true Heavenly Father and connect with him more while also becoming more connected with Mother Nature. Poppy has a degree in counseling, has specialized in narrative therapy, has training as a small group facilitator, teaching communication skills and courses such as Changes That Heal. She has studied traditional herbal medicine during cancer, more challenge treatments, and was a retreat co-facilitator prior to 2017 when her memories started to crowd in. At the, time, at the time her memory started pouring in, she was not able to tend to others' lives while her own life needed so much attention. Poppy is still actively on her healing journey, and already she has such a bright light in the darkness, shining her candle wherever she can to heal herself and the world around her. Poppy Joy is literally the living definition of the word joy. No one would ever, ever guess the horror she went through and healed through and that is one of the many reasons why I'm excited for you all to meet her today. Poppy has overcome every obstacle put in the way to stop her from healing, including having to leave a therapist she had trusted who embodied Baphomet and betrayed her, and has had so much love in her heart that you can just feel it overflowing out of her when she speaks and through her beautiful energy. Poppy is extremely articulate when she speaks and has such a deeply loving and optimistic way of looking at life. Something we should all appreciate learning from survivors is how to embody this type of perseverance and love in our own lives. Poppy sets a powerful example for all of us to follow, and I know you will all fall as in love with her as I have. Poppy has just recently started speaking out about her story, and I ask you all to give her her full attention as you listen to this brave and beautiful warrior use her voice to rattle the Luciferian kingdom and provide another powerful puzzle piece to the puzzle we are all constructing together on the imagination.
Before I finish introducing today's guest, I wanted to give just a couple reminders and updates. If you'd like to be on the podcast as a guest or share any information privately with me, please email me at imagineabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. You can also use this email if you'd like to be a part of my new book series featuring written survivor testimonies, and you can find the video with all the details on how to submit your testimony on any of my podcast channels. And lastly, I'd love your support on Substack, where I'm taking up investigative journalism as an outlet for me personally to share about my podcast guests and advocacy work, and you can subscribe to me there at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. All my links are in the show notes, and I'd love your support across all platforms, you guys. Thank you all so much for caring so deeply about the survivors and whistleblowers and for helping to make the imagination the safest space on the internet for survivor disclosures. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming today's guest of honor, survivor, overcomer, voice for the voiceless, spiritual warrior, anti-child abuse advocate, walking miracle, and a woman who it is an absolute joy to call my new dear friend, the one, the only, Poppy Joy. Poppy, thank you so much for being here with me today. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for that beautiful, loving introduction. Um, thank you for seeing me. And I see you too. And um, yeah, this is such an important topic. It's, you know, I've been taking, it's been taking me a while to be able to get my voice healed enough to to get it out here um but you know I'm, I'm talking on behalf of many many people that have that voice no more they didn't survive and and there's you know so many people that you know there's just so much like I'm only just a little little wee part of the ones that have survived and can have the voice and I mean the partly the reason why I come across as love and joy is because that's what it took it took me to um, maintain and hold on to my soul um, and not have it shattered and taken from me. And that has been a miracle. Um, yeah, that's definitely been a miracle. I think even early near-death experiences right at the beginning of my life and having an experience with, with, with source, um, you know, it kept me in there and I kept returning back to source and to and to nature because that's where I found the help and the support and the love. Yeah. So uh, I, I was I was born in New Zealand. Both my parents had come over separately from England and um and the abuse looks like it really started in my mother's line. So my mother grew up near the Rothschild estate in Exbury. Her mother was a school teacher on that estate. And my mother said it was just a, a two classroom school. Um, and that was in, in, the, in the gardens, which are, I think they're really beautiful botanical gardens. Um, there and that was also where Jacob Rothschild who recently passed away in one sense <laughs> um he, where he was he was living um but my mother spoke of meeting Eugene Rothschild Eugene Rothschild actually had his home in New York and and he must have come over to England uh for family gatherings around Christmas time which are big ritual times actually and my mother when she was a girl talked about having um sherry and tarts with Eugene Rothschild and calling him a very nice man and she had an infatuation with queen and royalty Lord Montague she would wave to and 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 all of these things which um I found very difficult I found very difficult to handle, especially as I was realizing what these families do, what they are involved with. And when my mother actually did tell me about having these tarts and sherry with Eugene Rothschild, I sort of said, well, how old were you, mum? You know, because I was like, <laughs> I was really on the lookout. And um, and she sort of gasped a little bit and because she was, you know, like 80 or so then. And like all her memories would have been repressed. Like 
because I feel energy, I actually got to witness her repressing memories as they happened. Like as a child, she would um, be violent or something unpredictable. And then I would actually feel her pushing that memory down. It didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen until it was repressed. So this was part of her, her programming, I guess. My mother, I believe that she was also uh, ritually abused and programmed. Um, in the spirit, she did say she was programmed. Um, she actually desired to have a, a loving relationship with me, but I was absolutely too, too broken. And I find this out from doing these therapeutic journey sessions. And, you know, really you're, you're traveling through time and you get to speak to the soul of, of the people that you've had issues with and you hear their truth. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have like said, well, you know, what terrible parents they've sold you into this. And, and it's not as simple as that. And it never is. They were blackmailed. And I believe that the Rothschilds, like my mother came all the way over from England to New Zealand. And my question was, what were you running away from, mum? And, you know, I could never really have that conversation with her. But I felt she was really running from something to come you know, right around the world and get, get away from her family and, and everything like that. Now, her father was a nuclear research, a nuclear physicist, and he was used um, in the war to do nuclear research and radiotherapy research in a hospital. Mm. And he didn't get drafted to war because that was his purpose and his job. Now, I know that things get compartmentalized. <laughs> and when things get compartmentalized, people don't even know what their research is going towards. Um, but one thing I do know is that he held a lot of guilt towards Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the bombing there. And my mother, she went over to Japan and melted down and cried over there. I went over to Japan with my daughter and did a special thing in Hiroshima. I just absolutely melt, melted down and cried and cried and cried because I felt this on my bloodline. Yeah, so. Um, oh, devastating. Yeah, it was. It was really, really devastating because I'm so sensitive when I go to places like that, I feel all oh, what's not said. I feel the cover-ups and how the Japanese people were given a story that they had to hold and keep themselves and how, um, you know, like just the devastation and the pain that, 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 that is there. So that's a little bit in my, in my bloodline. Um, my uncle, my auntie, my auntie, um, she was a negative blood, blood type. Um, but on your mom's side? Yeah, on my mom's side, her younger sister. And uh, she she was trying to get the goods out of me one day <laughs> when I was sort of saying there's been sexual abuse in the family and all that, but I wasn't prepared to, to talk. But she was trying to say, well, well, this is what happened to me. I was molested by by John, her older brother. So there was that going on in the family as well, which is obviously a sign that things are pretty out. And um, yeah, so yeah, so my parents came over here um, and they were blackmailed. And your dad wasn't, you don't think that his he was uh, programmed or that there was no history in his family of anything? Nothing that I can absolutely recall, right. but he was definitely brought into it. Um, and he was a very cruel, he was very cruel to animals. Like he was always killing cats. And like mm. I had my, my best friend was a cat and he, he shot it in front of me, you know, and, oh. and then started to have dreams about um, him shooting babies 
in front of me all my life this was like a recurring dream I'd have of him holding a baby out to the side it was a baby boy and then he would just shoot this baby and bury it behind the shed and I used to have this recurring dream like just for, for years and years and years you know and I guess that was just my um, consciousness trying to come up yeah so so the two-year-old ritual which is the first one I believe happened even though there was another experience that was young, younger so at 15 months my mother sexually vi sexually violated me it was in a moment I mean I've got here through regression I've been doing regression now for many many decades uh, with breath work and things like that so um so it had been 15 months and she sexually violated me um and it sort of happened at the time, like I never, we never bonded when I was born. And, um, and I was just looking at her with love, like I wanted to bond with my mother. And then as I was looking, it was almost like this, her eyes just went steely, steely blue. And she just attacked me around my genitals. And after that time, we have what we call plunket here in New Zealand and it's like a record for babies and you have nurses that come and monitor the babies weigh the body babies <laughs> and when I was 15 months I just literally just stopped thriving I stopped growing and I, I I mean I was always below I was always really tiny I was a very small baby but I just I just stopped thriving and um so that was that first attack which almost and I saw in that memory I saw a possession come over her and and it wasn't her and it never is and that's that's what I've got to see now and how everything works in the greater scheme of things there's pawns upon pawns of the system that go all the way up to these grandmasters and and beyond so yeah that 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 happened and then I'm pretty sure this was an Easter ritual um at the age of two um was the next big event um partly how I knew that is just because Easter just I would just go crazy at Easter I just couldn't cope I'd be triggered left right and center I'd feel all the rituals going on while everyone's celebrating and I still do I can't handle Christmas I can't handle New Year and Easter's another very fragile time I've been doing so much healing work now it'll be interesting to see how I get through Easter this year because a lot of the emotional charge from these things has been released by going into the rituals seeing what happens with a warrior woman who can be there for me who really understands uh, SRA or satanic ritual and she's just been yeah I, I don't you know like there's so many things that saved my life and I do believe that that is like our heavenly father our earthly mother's presence that comes in and miraculously I get saved it always feels like it's the last minute but that's what used to happen in ritual is you get saved at the last minute and I do believe that they take you to the edge of death I do believe they actually sometimes you do die and I, and then they have their secret medical teams that have their secret places that put you know that you you stay in I, I'm pretty sure I don't have any memory of this yet but I'm pretty sure they they drug you if you're really really badly beaten and you know you just sort of just um coming back um I do believe that one of the reasons that I wasn't ever killed um outright and left was that they were trying to program me for their own uses and they were getting really, really uh, annoyed with me because I wouldn't comply. And I just kept coming back. <laughs> um, and I mean, like terribly, terribly shattered, terribly bullied, terribly broken, um, terribly alone. Like it was a living hell. <laughs> really all of my childhood but you would never have known because I was so so programmed to smile so programmed to hide my injuries like I know that I had spinal injuries all my life 
and you know like you just have to keep on just keep going you keep going and you don't complain mm -hmm. and my father would regularly call me a hypochondriac if I you know for what I did did say so there was sort of um and you know I used to lose it I actually would get hysterical at times as a child I just couldn't take any more and I just and my father would ridicule me and he'd mock me and he'd go there she is whipping herself up into a frenzy and this is the sort of thing he would say you know and and this would only happen when I just couldn't take it anymore and I would be losing it which later eventuated to sort of trying to go out and commit suicide you know but it was more suicidal ideation I was always got saved at the last minute something would snap me out of of it um and and then I realized that every time suicidal ideation come up all I had to do was write it out write it out write it out and always a miracle would come in it was like I'd have this massive revelation I would just get so in touch with this love that I had encountered as a two-year-old I believe that after that two-year-old ritual I had this experience where I just saw this it was kind of like this massive disc of golden light and I was kind of really drawn to it and I think that it helped me to get back into my body which of course was um, totally beaten up and in immense pain and really swollen a little bit like the jellyfish thing probably reminded me of and, and other things and Oh and the dogs, the dogs, they dogs are used in ritual. Um, in my rituals, it was always sodomy. It was never vaginal penetration, and it was bestiality, um, with a dog and uh, I'm a goat in the first one, which was highly, highly, highly orchestrated by. Uh, um, in my memory, I'm sure it would have been like a Rothschild representative. He, so at the beginning of that ritual, writ, you know, the writ is is the word. And this is, oh, I'll get into that later. But ritual is that that word has got a lot of oomph. Um, so where was I? I just sorry, I just lost myself a minute. Oh, you're okay. You were talking about, I believe, the two year old ritual and Rothschild's involvement with that. Yes, yes, that's right. So, so my memories initially were just sight, set, smelts, you know, they were two year old memories. And then when I, I went into the regression and the journey, it's kind of like you visit the scene, you look at it out from the outside in a very safe way, and you actually get to see and you get to talk to those that are a part of it. Um, and they have to tell the truth. And it's quite amazing how this happens. And this this is amazing when you get the revelation on it all. Um, so, sorry, I get okay. things in my head. Can I, I ask made, something real right. quick? Yeah. I know that. I know. I sometimes feel like that too. It's, it's hard to sometimes, it's like you're trying to burp up something that's really, really hard to say. You know, I can only yeah. It's even yeah. worse if you've gone through this, you know, I, I feel it in my own way, not being a survivor, just it's difficult to talk about this, but I wanted to ask you, um, what was the blackmailing that your parents, uh, was this through, was the government blackmailing them? If you don't want to talk about it in depth, you don't have to, but I wanted to clarify, uh, make sure that we explain that just in case it's a, it's, it seems like it's sort of a key point of how you got pushed into this in a way. Okay, so my memory was that um, I was just little uh, and um, my father uh, was doing paperwork, exchanging paperwork with a man and it was the same man. It felt exactly like the same man who orchestrated the ritual. So I was sitting on his knee. Um, they were, I, could, I could feel the anxiety in my father. He was incredibly anxious and... I and this man had me on my knee and he was like being really really nice to me he was like and I felt comfortable with him and and um I believe they were doing the paperwork and I do believe it was to do with the money system like in 1967 they brought in the 
um, dollars and cents currency and they went out of the pounds and shillings currency. So I believe there could have been that aspect of the government coming in. And I do believe that that legislation was written on my blood and the blood of a beautiful pregnant Māori woman who was sacrificed by having the baby cut out of her in that ritual. And as a two-year-old, being up on an altar and looking down and, and, and seeing that. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And then her terrified dead spirit coming into me, which has sabotaged me all my life. So um, since that was released, my life changed massively. Um, and so I would, what was happening, I was like defaming myself. I was humiliating myself. I was, um, and this was this energy that would keep coming out. And, um, and I, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't connect with other survivors. It was like I tried to connect with other survivors and crazy things would happen. Like I'd get hacked and then every and then in that group it was probably getting all those hack messages and things in it and you know, just awful things. And I like I wanted to connect with another survivor particularly and I I I, I thought, no, I can't, I have to wait. I have to wait because it's not safe. I'm not safe for her, you know? So yeah, that that was happening. But then in the in that two year old ritual, I'm pretty sure that man was there. Like I was taken in a flash car, sitting in the back, like I was some kind of royalty or something. I was treated like I was really, really special, and I was given the message to a two year old, however, that I was really, really special, and some and that I would something I was going to take part in something really special, and I felt very comfortable with the man. The thing about him is that his emotions were absolutely streamlined. They didn't go up, they didn't go down, no matter what happened, no matter what happened. But it was like he was conducting the whole thing. And then there was all the men in robes. Um, there was chanting and um, and it's just patterning that seems to be very, very Masonic that sort of comes up. Um, so with the chanting and the, the murdering of this beautiful woman, and I'm, I'm just say that because um, in that process, I got to release her soul to go back with her baby. And she was really young. Um, I don't know where she'd got from, but I know that there were a lot of places around there where it was seen as shameful to be a pregnant mum and people used to hide pregnancies. Um, she could have gone off to one of these places where people go to have a baby. I don't know how she got in there. Um, but, it, you know, there was no, no pain relief. She had a man on each limb holding her down and another man... Um, all caped and robed with a knife that looks like the knife that Kronos holds. Um, sorry, I should have given you that graphic. Um, but it was a very specifically shaped knife and and I didn't even know what it was. It's kind of like a crescent half moon shaped knife. And, um, you know, it was just, it was terrible bloodbath. And, and then what I see happen next was that I was adorned with a, it was like a, a christening gown. It was a gap, bright gown, but it was covered like up from here down, sort of a little bit lower down in, in, in the blood. And that was put on me. And then I was on the altar. I had my arms tied behind my back and my shoulder was sort of popping in and out. And like, yeah, being pulled, there was a goat behind me in a crate. And I don't need to say much more. You can imagine the rest. It was it was um and then and then having after that men and this is what I find so disturbing is that my father was brought into that ritual. Um and I don't know in my 
my thing, he had to be drugged. <laughs> he had to be drugged to be doing what he was doing. Um, I, I believe I, I died and I couldn't see anything after, I don't know if I choked from penises in my mouth. Um, you know, a lot of pain and I think there was only two. The second one was very violent and um, I think it probably broke my higher bone, like the cranial sacral practitioner I had said, how did you get your higher bone broken? <laughs> and um, and it must have been that. And, uh, and, and then I, next thing I, I was put in a pit and there was, it was a pit with a whole lot of dead bodies and, and anim animals and human, I think. It stunk. It was like on the ground. It was very, I was lying on my left side and I just felt burning and acidic sort of feelings all down my side. Um, but I kind of, it was really, really, really disturbing. And this is where I, am, I don't know how planned all these things are because they whip it up they whip it up um, so that basically Lucifer is orchestrating everything as well. So the I saw this big image of this amazing presence of golden light. And it was like, I just experienced the most extreme hell. And then this was like, the most amazing love it was like this incredible love and I was over hovering above my body looking down and looking at these other it was a pile of remains and I don't know that yeah it was putrid anyway um and then the next thing I kind of see my father coming down the stairs and I don't know, I was like in this concrete square place or something and my father comes down and I think I zoomed back into my body and then he he just picked me up and he was like crying and crying and um, yeah, so. You're doing so good. I know it's yeah. so hard. It's good to. It's really good to to be able to get this out. It's so horrible, you know. It, just it, it gosh, is. That, because that's like yeah. what people don't see is like the humanity in these people. Like you said, like they're forced to do stuff just like you were, you know. And yeah, seeing your dad like doing these horrible things, and then like having a human moment where he's like, "What did I do?" You know, like what? Yeah, you know, it's well, like oh. I don't, you see, I don't think, look, I know that my parents were just about to go and to get a mortgage and all of that sort of stuff, and but they worked hard for all of that. I don't think they got incredibly paid out by what they did. They didn't become filthy rich like in any of these elite families or anything like that. Um, and... You know, they it, it was the time when behaviorists was all that, and they it was like I think they were persuaded that oh she'll never remember, she'll never know, because you know anything under the age of three, well we just don't. Um, but you know even like while I was growing up, um, while I was growing up I was early teens, and uh, a family friend's daughter had just committed suicide. And my parents sat me down and said, now you must never go and see a hypnotherapist. People go to hypnotherapists and then they make up stories and they get their families in trouble for things they haven't done. And that's what they said, like outright. Now I had, I couldn't remember anything this time. And I'm like, well, why are you telling me that? You know, but I always remember that. And so I think they were afraid. And then when I sort of started to go through puberty and anything, my father wouldn't even touch me anymore. He wouldn't hold me. And I really felt him withdraw away from me. And it was like, um, he just didn't want to be in trouble for 
for anything, you know, and um, and so I think at some level they must have had memories in and out and in and out and in and out, and and were still trying to hide it. Um, and there were there was something that happened that involved my brother, which so I do believe my brother also he was older than me. I do believe that maybe he had something and he had issues, uh, health issues growing up and then his wife told me things about him that were very unusual I just don't want to say too much because he's still alive and I still respect him even though he's been incredibly narcissistic and nasty towards me um because I believe that he got got um he's been a little bit he's almost the spitting image of my grandfather <laughs> and he's also an incredibly gifted scientist um and he got called on to make vaccine, uh, to do vaccine research within a forestry institute. And so I just think, well, how alike is that to my grandfather doing nuclear research in the war, you know? And, um, you know, like, he doesn't know, like, just totally programmed, you know? Like, I tried to tell him once about, you know, because I've been, like, aware of the bigger scheme of things the banking agendas all of that I've, I've known that for a long time and I remember trying to tell about it and I was going they this and they that and he would go who's they you know and and you know and then when before COVID came out he was saying well the whole world's going to have to be vaccinated and and I was like well you know you really think that's going to happen that the whole world's going to do that like to me that was insanity but you know that was his whole push uh, so I think my family were very they were scared into conformity so we were raised all of us were raised to be really conformed and I was just the rebel I could not I just could not there were just things I could not do I could not conform in some ways and it made it dangerous for me. And I believe I've been punished all my life. I've been in a lot of poverty. I was homeless a lot. I had trouble finding housing. I um, got bullied. I got done over time and time and time and time again. And I just maintained the stance of, of you know, love and truth um, and and for me, when, when, when if I got really, really attacked, um, like once I got, I think I was hit with an energy weapon or something. And because um, I was getting, I don't know, I became a bit of a researcher and I started to sniff out culprits. It was just one thing that has been a part of my life. And I was starting to get quite onto it with someone. And then I was actually in the bathroom one day and my head just <laughs> And I just fell to the floor and I couldn't get up. And um, and then I went out and I told my then partner at the time and I said, told him what had happened and like my all my neurons were fried. It was just, and it took days to recover. And and I just said to him, can you just keep me in a happy mood? Can you just, can can we just keep things light? You know, can, can we just stay in love? You know, like, and that's what I knew I had to do. So... He, he he did help like he was also a handler not the worst handler I'd ever had but he's had some really good thing he he introduced me to breath work and therapeutic processes which have been helping me you know so there's that that was a really amazing side to him but he was also incredibly controlling um and you know he just had ways but I, I just know that he was also a very hurt soul and I was just always waiting for the day when he would come to me and say look um let's do some therapy and stuff on me because um but he never could he always went to other people and I, I think you know often that is the case that people can become narcissistic because they can't even face what's happened inside of themselves and so everything goes out and they project everything to the outside to the other people and it uh, can be a safety thing. It wasn't all bad, you know. Um, yeah. Can I so ask you that, something? Um, going back to some of the memories that you talked about, 
when were you, when did you become aware of of the Freemasonry ties? And can you talk a little bit how that ties into what you were just saying um, about what you experienced and and if you were at lodges or sort of like what were the telltale signs for you? Yeah, I don't even remember being in a lodge, but the the thing that really really gave it away was another ritual that I would have been sorry. <laughs> here it goes again when I was about seven or eight um and this was with dogs um and it was oh I, yeah sorry I just get these images flashes like Jacob Rothschild Montgomery Burns and the symptoms and the Simpsons he used to say release the hounds and it was very triggering for me because when they release the hounds and rituals that a hunt and uh, very dangerous, and there's raping that goes on. Okay, so this was in that ritual. But what I remember is um, lots of things happen in rituals. There's lots and lots and lots. Where I got the first Masonic connection was that, well, uh, well, best I'll back up. It seems to me that when they do rituals, it's a bit like a cat playing with a mouse. The cat will terrorize and torture the mouse until the mouse is just limp and surrendered. And, and then it eats the mouse. It seems to be that when the human being or the sacrifice is just done, like you just, that's it, you know, that's when they seem to take the fluids out of your, near the spine, near the, um, in the back here, back of the neck. And what I, what I was seeing was the positioning and the throne-like structures and the V patterns. All of these things were coming in with it. And when I was seeing where they took stuff out of my spine, and it really actually felt like they took spinal fluid, not just... Um, adrenalized blood I don't even know exactly I still don't look into other people's stories because I, I I just don't want to be influenced by them I you know um so so what I I saw was these little black cubes that were in my spine but they were arranged in that inverted pentacle way so don't 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 and and then they were like black cubes and I was like black cubes and then and and actually that was when Marie says yes that's something but we carried on you know and then I saw these black cubes and and then what I did was I went and researched black cubes afterwards and I found that they were all related to back going back to Saturn where Satanism comes from, Kronos, the god, the Catholic ballistic Greek god, that's written in history, that's all entangled. And I found out about um, that the black cube is a thing that is in Saturn. So the Saturn has a ring, which I don't believe those rings are natural. So Saturn is contained, and this is but from other things I see, my own visions, all sorts of mixtures of things, um, that there's a lot of Draco reptilian input into all of this as well, which I believe is where the that a lot of is um, satanic or reptilian technology which is used in the world which has harnessed us and kept us in slavery now as a whole population so I was just researching what are black cubes and then I actually saw what happens in, in lodges what they do to a mason who betrays the fellowship or with the men or whatever is they get something called being blackballed and it's just the worst cursing ever. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I have been blackballed by the Masons. And this really rang true for me. And the curses that have been put on my life, I would say, yes, that, that has it. I've never, I've been denied of love, um, loving people around me. 
um, having a home, having food met at different times. Um, I, everything that I put money to turns to shit, <laughs> excuse that, but it's just like, it's, it's cursing. It goes beyond everything. You know, people, I, I've been accused of this, this woman, this therapist who turned rogue, she just says, oh, you just blame everyone and everything, you know, which is, is what, well, you know, when, when you're under this barrage of curses, and you start to see what's going on, it can really appear like that's what you're doing. Um, and, you know, and then people just think, oh, you're just getting off on on, on pretending and feigning sickness and, and victimhood and all that. And I'm no victim. Honestly, I am no victim. I, I am here to stop this in its tracks as much as I possibly can. I don't want another baby harmed. And it just hurts my heart knowing that it's still going on as we speak. And Easter's coming up and I just want it all to stop. Please make it stop. You know, Easter is just one of the most foulest, foulest times to do with this ritual. And it all coincides with religious celebration and a lot of energy is used and harnessed out of all of that. But yeah, the black cube, when I, I discovered that, um, and then I saw the, the hexagon that they've discovered, NASA discovered at the very top at the North Pole, North Pole of Saturn. And this is the black cube that is in Mecca. So if, if you look at the, um, you look at the Israeli Star of David, if you put that in there, it's like a hexagonal thing. And a lot of it goes back to satanic worship. So they walk around and around and around this cube every day. Um, and this creates a lot of energy and it's just like the ring of Saturn because I get to see all this energy in my visions and they're generating this energy and it's feeding and feeding and feeding because um, do you read, I mean, I know that a lot of people think this, but if we're really, really honest with ourselves, create a God, would he have any requirement to be worshipped? So I don't think so. That's create a God. And to me, any, any religion, and this is where I feel, feel that Satanism has crept into not all, but some of Christianity. Because it's like when that worship and generating that worship of churches and Masonic structures and those cathedrals and all of that creates noosh and it creates energy, which they live off. <laughs> um, the powers that want to be, you know, they, they get that. And I have had my energy siphoned and siphoned and siphoned. And this was also to do with um, I, I want to call it technology that was left in me from rituals. So they're masters of geometry. Um, they're, they're the masters of the matrix, the architecture of the matrix, or they represent it. Okay, so if someone's just an early day businessman and they've been invited by the Masons, they're not going to know any of that. And there's really good people. There's really good people that get there and they go in there because it's kind of like a business thing. You know, it's part of the business fraternity. It's some kind of a brotherhood, some kind of belonging. I, I think it's once you get up to that third degree and there's some kind of ritual that's involved where they get put through the third degree, which is something to do with humiliation. There's oaths. There may be drinking stuff. I, I, I don't know. It. I actually find it so repulsive. It's very hard to look at. Anyway, so I'm not, I don't want to cast anyone out, you know, and, and call it all out as it's all bad, um, because I do believe that's probably good and honest people that start out there. But then you climb and you go up those degrees, and you get up to that 33rd degree, and then there's the Grand Masters. And they are the ones, I believe, that are orchestrating these rituals, and they know exactly what they're doing. 
and they can harness the power of Baphomet, Satan, Lucifer, um, and that will that will enhance their businesses, that will bring money their way. Um, it's in the celebrity world. People get fame and fortune, popularity, uh, power. And so it's it seems to be what it's all about, overpowering. To me, the true heavenly father, and I really, to me, the earthly mother is just as much a force. Like to me, the heavenly father is the one that sees creation with amazing um, energy that, that is sent to us on a daily basis through the sun. And the earth grows the creation and we grow the creation with our consciousness with her. So that's to me how they fit together. But that true heavenly father, the true earthly mother, equality. Every soul is equal. No bloodline is superior to another. No race. It doesn't care who begat who and who begat that, you know, which actually when you look at all of those codes that are in the Old Testament, you can actually see how they relate to the families that live today. And in that Old Testament of the Bible, there's just so much uh, sodomy. There's so much child sacrifice. There's um, all of this terrible, terrible stuff. Like when I was a pastor's wife, when I was a Christian, I just found the Old Testament repulsive. And I used to say, how can this be? Like, how can this be part of Christianity? Like, you know, it could never... I could never work it out. I could never find it out. And then, you know, well, I, I thought, well, this the story of Jesus, yeah, that, that's got something in there, you know. Um, but now, having been a sacrifice myself, having been confronted by people, when you say, well, you know, I I was sacrificed, and I died and I came back, they go, oh, oh, you know, and they really react and they think you've got a Jesus complex. Well, actually, that actually stops that message coming out because there's a lot of programming around sacrifice. And this was, to me, this was a period of our evolution that had to happen for human development and growth but so many people are sacrificed so many people don't live is hanging on a cross as bad as the rape and the witnessing and everything on a child you know like and then you're shut up I've been shut up I'm not allowed to say it because, oh, we can't talk about that because that's Jesus, you know. But but how many people have been through this actual experience and got shut out and shut up because of religious programming that, uh, well, actually only one people died for all of our sins. To me, I don't see sacrifice as a healthy thing at all. I want it to stop. And I and and people don't realize millions upon millions, I don't know the figures, of babies and other people, pregnant women, um, are used on these ritual dates and they're going through exactly that. And 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 none of us. If we're survivors, we don't think we're superior to anyone. We we know what it's like to be hell and be the scum of the earth and treated like that because that's what we were. And to have your self-esteem crushed to nothing, like to be worthless, you know, like you go in hell and there's just worms crawling around and dead bodies, you know, like it's awful, it's disgusting, it's putrid, it's vile, and it's terrible, terrible, terrible crime. And it's covered and it's kept secret. And, um, and you know, like I go around in this world, I don't have protection. 
I'm on my own. I am my own protection. And I've had to use all my intuition and all my ways to to keep myself safe because it's not been safe. And I'm not given any protection in this world. I have to be my own defender. And, you know, like I'm, I'm in a constant state of prayer, I tell you, <laughs> because, of, and that is it, you know, like miracles happen and I see the miracle, I see the weaving in and out of how I got out of that situation and how I got out of that situation, situation in the nick of time. But it's too, too often it's brought me to death's door and I'm really over it and I'm really tired of it. Because even at the end of last year, I mean, sorry, about almost a year ago, heading up to Easter, I started to have an experience and I had this vision. Um, I went and did a, it was a, it was a journey therapy, but it was a woman who actually taken over the journey therapy, put a label on it, made it her own, but it was healthy, you know, like I had that experience. Um, and when I, and my question was, why, why me, you know, and I wanted to know what, why me? And it was really bizarre because as part of that journey, I had a vision, and here I am, Leonardo da Vinci, grand master, um, painted that with all the geometry, with all the patterning in that Leonardo da Vinci last supper, last supper, you know, where he portrayed Jesus as a white man, and I, and somewhere in my research, someone was saying, well, that was. He painted that as his lover and then that became the image of Jesus that everybody took on or a lot of people took on there might have been others as well but I was here as I on the scene but I was standing here and I was this Indian woman and I had the name Matamana Sat which means she who finds the truth and tells the truth and I thought oh oh I'm here to find the truth and tell the truth and and that was why what really came out of out of that journey therapy thing and then in another ritual which wasn't in a lodge I believe it was underground it was backlit but it felt like it was in that same scene except that I was sitting at the table and looking out <laughs> and what I was looking at was disgusting because someone had just been sacrificed and he was being cooked um and and so they use this imagery there's something about all of this it's so sick and to me it's really satanic and I don't ever want to I don't really and I know I've got to be really careful when I say this because look I was Christian for many 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 years and it actually served me you know it served me and I needed that and that relationship with the heavenly father is treasure it's absolutely incredible and we all find it our own way sorry in our own time and I don't want to put people off and I'm, I'm not but I, I do feel I need to say these particular things because of the confusion that can come in so that was that was a particularly nasty ritual and I believe and it just felt to me like they have these places that are underground and they are, they are rooms, they are hallways, they are big spacious areas and they must be incredibly well guarded. I don't know where they are. I don't know how I got in there. I, um, I believe I was taken out of a family tent that night. I believe I would have had to have been... Um, I would have needed medical help after. Um, so they have it all sewn up. Yeah. And so <sighs> this is where I see the Masonic thing coming in. And it's like also to do with the, the programming. And like in that particular ritual, there were dogs. And I was terrified. And I think they had like muzzles on their mouths because I think they would have just you know they were so frantic what kind that, of dogs you know, were they they yeah. seemed like they were like skinny they were houndish looking okay yeah or maybe or something like that like pardon 
maybe like a Rottweiler or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Look, I ended up doing a painting about, I did a painting once about um, pee and they, they were like, I don't know, to me, they like spirit dogs. <laughs> they, oh. they just, um, you know, like part, part of it doesn't even feel like, I don't know. I, I don't even know how. Yeah, but they were sleek. They were sleek. And like I was only little, so they seemed huge. Yeah. And um and then it and then what happened was obviously some man had lost his lot or whatever, and he was the one that, that was going to get sacrificed. And what happened is he came, he was naked and he was over the top of me he was protecting me from the dogs and I felt him and he felt like a priest <laughs> and, and, and he was saving me and I felt like he was saving me and, but I didn't realize. And then the next, then I don't know what happened behind him, but he must, I imagine he must've been stabbed in the bag or, or something because his breathing got really labored over the top of me. And he was sort of holding me and um, and I don't know, in my consciousness, this must be the MK Ultra programming, I actually felt like someone was trying to save me from, from a ritual. And, well, he got killed in that one. I didn't. And, and then they, they make you do horrible, horrible, horrible things with that with it and it's long it's drawn out it's just you, you know I just I remember like just tr vomiting and choking on on vomit and things and um and just having these caked beings around me with hoods um and they don't they were going up and down in size and I've been too scared in my visions to see what they were actually like, but I, 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 I totally believe it when um, other, other SRA victims have said that they go down and there's actual um, reptilians. Yeah. So it's incredibly disgusting. And I've just been really lately, like a smell keeps coming up. And I contacted a friend who has also been through terrible stuff. And I said, look, I've got the smell. And he said, look, it would be from down on those pits of hell that he knows about as well. And, you know, it's sulfury, a bit musty. And, and basically, like, and I used to get it, like, when I was selling girl guide biscuits, I used to help, have to sell girl guide biscuits when I was a little girl in my town. And I used to... I was terrified and I used to have to hold it and no one would know I was terrified. I'd go into some of the houses and I'd smell that smell and it was just, it would just, it was just like somewhere in my consciousness there was just a massive amount of fear because it's a smell that doesn't really, you know, and you're mixing and mingling in a neighbourhood with people that could have partaken in your rituals. And, and that's what's just so, so, so scary is you don't know who's who, what's what. As a child, you know, that year after that particular ritual, I, I don't know, but I it felt to me like it was just about every day I, I was placed in the centre of the classroom and I'd wet my pants every day. And I didn't know. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just remember I'd just freeze. I'd be sitting in my chair I knew something terrible was going to happen. I didn't know what it was. And the next thing I was being ridiculed because there was a puddle of water under me. And I'd be sent to the headmistress who I felt was involved. And she would tell me off and, you know, and belittle me and pull me down. And then I'd have to go home with my wet knickers in my bag. And my mother would go, you dirty, horrible, smelly little girl. And she would do this over and over and over again because she found it extremely embarrassing because my symptoms were coming out and she couldn't keep it under wraps they couldn't keep it down so you know it, it was it was just hellish but I believe that they did that 
I don't know how many rituals I've been involved. I don't know. I asked how many times have I died in ritual and I got figure nine, but I don't know for sure. So I had an open grave ritual, um, which one of your, your um, beautiful, beautiful guests was talking about and it suddenly added up. Why was I put into a grave? I wasn't in a coffin and that why I was in, you know, to me, I think I had got hypothermia and stuff in there. I think they were putting foul like honestly I just feel like they were putting sewage in there and I was gagging and then there was bits of dirt going on me and there was and I was just like terrorized and I I, I think I could have I, I just remember slipping in and out of consciousness I don't know how I got out of that again um yeah so and this is where like what are the what are the masons they know all about the grid lines. They know all about the ley lines that go in the ground. So they will perform rituals with innocent children to get the terror back into Mother Earth's body, you know, because then it affects everybody. So I became a grid worker. Um, I started to do my own grid work with crystals. And one of the first ones I did was for child trafficking around Asia. Um, which I just got to do that and that was also the time that I that was very close to when I had the jellyfish sting and it all came up so it's just amazing how everything starts to fit together I do that ritual and then you know I do it wasn't a ritual it was a ceremony for me because I sing you know I sing um, Christians will call it tongues or others call it light language so I sing this language which is just this pure beautiful language that comes through my heart and I do that with the with the gifting and it's just like you just go into joy with that song and with that singing and it's just like you just well I just feel one with everything you know and I used to do it a little bit publicly but now I really keep it to myself and you know the shower is a great place <laughs> or in your car while you're driving right yeah yeah oh like, <laughs> ah yeah you can go hard you know at the top yeah at the top <laughs> like that's so good yeah 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 wow. so yeah and I just yeah. I want to bring up to you just to corroborate what you were saying about you know the the faults with religion you know one of the things that I think no matter what we believe I think we can all agree that that no matter what, like religious establishments and leaders in all of those communities are not doing their job, accepting mm -hmm. survivors into their communities. They're just not like it is one of the worst places for survivors to go in a church. Most of the time it is very few and far in between when this conversation is allowed. And it's yeah. like, how are why are we supporting anything, any businesses that are shutting out our our survivors and whistleblowers that need the safe space. Like they are yeah. not providing any type of safety for the most part. And a lot of them are complicit in this, you know? So I think that there's, there is the difference between having a spiritual belief and being in an establishment that like you said, you know, and even a lot of these establishments, like we're worshiping a priest or a, a church leader, instead of going right to the source of what we believe, God, source, universe, whatever it is that somebody believes, like we're yeah. going to a, a middle person to connect us with that person. And they're saying, tell me all your sins so I can communicate it with, yeah. with God. And then you'll be forgiven, you know, and, and we forget, I think, and I did too, for a long time, like I thought I was weird because I didn't want to practice my spirituality in a church. I just felt so invaded. I felt horrible like yeah. having to sit in a pew with with a with a priest and like share things that I was doing that were sins with somebody that was probably sinning right and like yeah. I didn't know this person but I'm like I'm looking to him for forgiveness through God when I can just connect with him myself you know yeah. and like churches you know we need to do better with if whatever our belief is like we need to really align with, with people, places, and things that are inviting survivors in and saying, you are welcome here. Like first and foremost, like you need to be here because you're healing. Like we need you here. We're going to provide you with the community where you're going to have support. You can share your story. Others can come in and, and be with you. Like, it's really terrible hearing about how religion just completely you know, shuts out survivors, shuts out whistleblowers and shuts out anybody who wants to talk about satanic ritual abuse, human trafficking, 
um, mind control. Like you can't talk about that in these establishments. And it's really sad because these are the spaces that should pro be providing the most safety and protection yeah. for our most yeah. vulnerable population and bringing awareness to it. Because most likely if, you know, if, if church leaders were to listen to testimonies, they'd see that a lot of children went to church and were being abused behind the scenes or by other yeah. leaders in the church. Like it's very, very common mm -hmm. in these stories. So like chances are there's somebody being abused that's sitting in their Sunday service and they're not talking about it. They're not trying to do yeah. anything to prevent it. And then anybody who does want to come in and prevent it and says, Hey, can I talk about my story? Can I educate? They're saying, no, get out. You know, yeah. it's really sad. It so like, I do want to like corroborate that with you. Cause that's a big problem I have too. Yeah. Well, it actually happened to me firsthand. So, you know, I was a pastor's wife, like when I ended up marrying the man I married, um, <sighs> it was almost like I got caught like he changed just like that as soon as we got married it was like he, he had me where he wanted me and then he told me how it was going to be but he became a pastor during that time and I noticed things happening in the church and I could feel things happening in the church something directly did happen into the church which affected one of my daughters I spoke up they protected the pedophiles and I was just I was devastated and then what the other thing that was going on, and I never twigged onto this at the time, but my ex had an addiction. And, and because I, I have this other side from that, like one night I was lying in bed and he was lying next to me and I just rolled over, how you doing tonight? <laughs> and I just saw this massive demon on his chest with a, and it's like straddling his chest and it had a knife just about to plunge into his heart. And I just went, Scrah! and I just screamed, you know. And then he got the hell of a fright. And he said, what, what, what happened? So I told him. And then he freaked out because he was just starting to entertain his, his thoughts, which he could have. Like he could lie right next to me. He could go down to hell. He could go. He had this fantasy. His mother had died. She died sort of having a Hare Krishna thing. He believed that she was a sinner. He had heaps of anger at woman and her. His fantasy was to go down and rape his mother in hell. So, and then, and then you know, things happen. We we started to go see a pastor, and even the uh, a part. Well, he was a pastor, but he was a, a, a counselor. And and then this counselor actually said to me, "Look, I can't handle this. This is too much. He's getting off on what he's telling me." But we'd all. I made an escape plan, and that if this behavior kept on you know he needed to move out of the home and and sort it out out there but what I didn't realize is that we went into separate bedrooms with all of that happening because I couldn't stand the lies and what was happening that was that he was just bringing all these entities and things into the house and because of what happened to me I was just waking up screaming time and time again because things were at me and over me and around me and um entities or demons or jinn or whatever you want to call it depending on what your you know your language is um and then and then just quite recently I was like why am I getting attacked at night because I have terrible terrible insomnia and and now I've found out that it actually comes with night attacks and um and I went and I went into a process and I like pray you show me you've got to show me what is going on where is this coming on coming from now I've been divorced from him since 2003 so when I saw that he was still doing and then I got it he was doing satanic sex magic and he was generating energy with orgasm and anger towards me still after all this time and I was getting um and and it was it was like all the curses of the Masonic thing get built up they keep coming back in I couldn't get a home I couldn't get money I've never had I've never had someone who actually genuinely just loves me I've had I've got started to have one or two friends that are coming around now I have I have uh one family member who I'm very close to um but I've been denied and I've, you know, I, I had to leave my community. I got frightened out of there because of the 
the crack scene that was there, I didn't feel safe. I, I kept getting visions and dreams that I was going to get broken into and things would get smashed up and I sort of got out of there real quick. But it, that meant I got isolated away from my community. So I don't, I've been away, I don't have friends. So I've actually been having to go through all of this really much on my own. But I do have an amazing counsellor now who it took me a long time to trust took me a few months to trust going to another counsellor and healing practitioners after what happened with the last one yeah so so yeah I actually rang the my ex-husband's pastor and told him what was going on he um at the time that we left I had a spinal injury which was to do with sexual things to do with him that came about not long before we split up and that was an also a last straw to me why I didn't want to have him in the house and the children were having nightmares and I thought oh my gosh they're getting infect affected as well by all these energies and um and he he we had an insurance policy and he had one on me and we had split up and realized shit I can never get back together with this man because it was just like this massive cloud left the whole property and home and the girls didn't want him back either my daughters um and and I went to go into hospital because I had to have spinal surgery because the disc actually uh, burst and um and then I get a, a letter in the mail and he had just increased the life insurance policy on my life and what I was picking up in the spirit world, and this is totally my own, you know, and I can't prove this any other way, was that he still was after my life. And it just seems that a lot of these people that are infected and hosted and connected up with Satanism are after my life. Which brings me on to the latest one, Ilchi Lee, if you want to flash up that picture. And then I'll explain, because this has been the last big round. Yeah, so I had been right into him, not him, sorry, his movement, which was basically Qigong. So they get people into the cult by doing Qigong, and Qigong in itself is great. It's wonderful. And what, does um, he have an organization or is it just training under him and it's like marketed under him? No, he has a huge organization. He's like on Wikipedia as well. He's uh, from South Korea. He uh, gets business entrepreneur awards every year. He's filthy rich. He's been buying up properties in Northland here where I am in New Zealand and wanted to make uh, New Zealand his headquarters and he has he everyone has to call him Susu Nim which means Grand Master and when we are in his presence he sits on a decorated chair white chair and we are when we were in his presence, we would have to sing or dance or perform on when when the cue was given. We would have to shout at the top of our voice. We'd go, yes, this is him. And you'd have to shout like this, you know, and, and this was all a, an energy thing. And, um, and in one of the actual meetings that I was in with him, he actually asked me and the others in the group to be his disciple. And he had a whole story about um, happenings on one of the mountains in Korea where he went up there and he reckons he had this big experience and it was all miraculous, but basically he seeks worship. And so what he has is he has a whole lot of masters all around the world and he's also been proved as a cult in a US court of law. But yeah. Yeah, so I got really into that. You can see I looked really happy in that photo. <laughs> I had just been, I just given thousands of dollars over to do a, a leadership training. Um, someone called uh, Sun Yong Park 
he was the master or my main teacher, uh, he kept saying to me, yes, Poppy, yes, Poppy, because they were fascinated with me because I had been a retreat facilitator in the past, hadn't been able to work for years, trying to get better, um, wanting to go back into, you know, facilitating retreats again. Anyway, so he was like, yes, Poppy, we support you, we support you. Um, and that kept me going and kept me going in, in, in the programs and just forking over thousands of, of dollars of money which um, had come out of a, a small inheritance my mother had left me. And then there came to one particular training and it was called the Golden Bell Training. And now the, the abusive therapist that I was with is also very much into this cult. And she said, oh, Poppy, let's do this training. And I said, no, I don't want to do that training because part of the training was you had to give him access to one of the chakras in your body. And I said, look, I don't agree that that's a healthy spiritual practice to do that. And anyway, she did her training and she said, look, I'm fine. It's all good. And she sort of, uh, you know, and I took it on board and I went and I went and did the next training. And then, well, you know, I was fooled by the gold light that I would see around him because I determined that gold light was good and the silver light was bad <laughs> it was just another trick you know something that was going on with me and so I did this training and in, the, in this training you have to generate a lot of a lot of energy and part of it is that you actually generate energy by bouncing up and down on the floor on your perineum and this is part of it and so of course if you bounce up and down on the floor with your perineum that creates a whole lot of energy from that part of your body, you know, that sexual part of your body. But anyway, that was part of the, in the training. But the, at the end of the training, you go and then you're all in this presence and you have to, you know, obey on a command and say, yes, Susu Mum, and prove yourself and do all of this sort of stuff. Um, and then you lie down and, and 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 you're told that he's going to send you bright light now and um and you've given him access to a chakra and basically he accessed me and when I was in just last week I was in the journey therapy over this one and what I saw was a, a golden big golden arrow that went right down and the very tip of that arrow went right down into below my genitals and it was also um he he used to say I'm shooting the arrow and he would actually say that and it, he said he was shooting golden arrows um anyway I found it in there and what had happened is that when I carried on doing qigong and I was doing it online in my little home that I was at, at at the time but what I was finding is that my energy was depleting like I'd build this energy and then it was gone you know and I was just like wrecked you know and my spine started really twisting now I do have spinal issues anyway and and then what happened was I lost internet and I couldn't carry on doing the online classes. And then I realized that he called himself Master Brain. All I could hear for several weeks was his voice in my head. And so when you're doing these um, Qigong, you're tapping your body like this, you know. And when you're tapping your body like this, it's actually a, a neuro-linguistic programming tool. And I know this a little bit from my counseling training and everything. So if you're tapping your body and they're giving you messages, you're actually tapping those commands and those messages into your body. A lot of them are great, like I am love and all of that. But then, you know, one day he said something like, I am an AI robot. And I'm like, what? Did I just catch what you said? And everyone's still tapping their body and all of that. And I talked to him afterwards. I said, you can't say that to people you know <laughs> and I used to question all of that but then what happened was I it, it came a point and I realized this was a cult and so I went to the teachers that I knew uh, Master Brain and his wife actually and then we were going to have a meeting together and I was going to talk to them and I wanted to say how I felt there was a cult 
And that night I actually dreamed that um, Sua, his wife, who was like his boss, I dreamt she had a she had a gun under her cardigan and she was going to shoot me. And I was like, oh, you know, and I, this was just a dream I had. Anyway, I thought, no, you know, just don't worry. It's just a dream. But I went off and I... Um, I, I said, look, I'm I'm really concerned. I think you're a cult. You've got you've got nine thousand dollars of my money. You've made all these promises to me. So they're you know like yeah they sure they would have supported me in facilitating retreats. But then they would have got the money. I would have had to do it their way with their pro programming and all of that. Not in my own capacity of just getting back out into the workforce one day and being able to make a way for myself. Now the complex PTSD and everything I've got is actually too much. There's no way I could work and be safe. At, you know, like I could do little bits here and little bits there, but there's no way. In fact, I hadn't done any full-time work for many years since I basically, um, since I got my degree <laughs> and put on my black cube square hat, um, <laughs> you know this is this is the irony that's your first degree uh, which of course my grandfather was absolutely delighted when he heard I was getting a, a, a degree and when he heard it was counseling he was like oh you know because they were going to get the secret you know and and um oh I'm going all over the place but my family were upset when I became a counselor they were upset when I went to join the church they were upset um when I started to do breath work particularly and like the first year that after I met my partner who taught me the breath work and everything initially, um, I spent that whole year doing healing and I started to have, you know, the lighter sexual abuse memories. There wasn't any SRA memories in that, but there was lighter ones. Um, like a crazy one came more into light. I had gone into it a little bit more, but my parents had invited a man into the house who wanted to be a doctor. I was very young and he, and my parents were extremely strict, but for some reason, they let me stay up all night with this man who ended up lying on top of me and we were kissing and cuddling and, and all sorts. And um, I was prepubescent and didn't really know, but I thought, and I felt he was like this energy of the man who saved me. So this is programming again. So I actually thought he was going to come and save me from my wretched life. And I fell desperately in love with him. It was a whole Cinderella story. I thought he was going to save me from my wretched life. I thought he was a knight in shining armor. And so that set up a really, really bad pattern with looking for love. <laughs> Glad I'm over that. <laughs> Gee. Yeah, but um, now I'm getting a little bit lost because I get a bit, you know, it's hard to to stay with things sometimes. So. Wonderful. These stories, as much as like you want to stay chronological, they never like it's impossible there's just too much to cover to explain stuff so you're doing yeah. perfect. You're putting all the puzzle pieces together and it's gonna make you jump around a little bit but that's perfectly fine yeah it's interweaving because one thing reminds you of another of another of another, sure. of another and it makes sense sometimes if you tell all the pieces of it at different times so it it shows like why something happened in the past and it relates to the yeah. future vice versa you know, so I know it can feel like you're jumping all over, but you're actually making perfect sense, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, like I, I don't really have any defense with these people, but yeah, what's really important. I think I need to say is that the therapist who had embodied, who had embodied, um, I'm pretty sure that's what she said she called it. She'd had an experience with Buffermen and she was almost like, Oh, Poppy, you could need to get into your shadow time. And she was always saying, like, well, this is all right. And I was just like taking note of that, but watching her personality change. Because she does, she seemed so sweet. I loved this woman. For years I loved her. You know? <laughs> and then she just turned. She totally turned. And a lot of it was because also I was saying, look, this I and she was my therapist. So I was saying, look, they've taken my money, they're a cult. And she would say, did you get benefits out of this? Are you in your okay? Don't put them down, you know, and, and all of this. And she was really defending them. 
and she wouldn't listen to me but she never listened to me even about SRA she would actually say come on get rid of your story get out of this now you know put it behind you and I haven't even remembered <laughs> so that was going on behind you? oh my gosh geez yeah 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 wow. so so when she dealt what she called it a tough love what was actually happening for me and I do believe it was a combination combination of of the compressions in my neck because um they're being very severe and they do they seem to you know sometimes when they're quite bad I can put them back but my legs go tingly and my arms go tingly and even in the roof of my mouth and and it's like this nerve wow 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 thing so there is nerve compression and damage so what was happening at the time was I was having these this lag in my neural responses and I couldn't even walk properly and um, like I was semi-paralyzed. I couldn't look after myself. I'd gone and I'd stayed with this friend who I was paying rent with, you know, so I guess I was renting. And um, and he was like really, really worried about me because I was not being able to look after myself anymore. And he kept saying, because he was really into the medical system, which I have a great fear of. And uh, he was like, you know, go to the hospital, you know, and, and said, you're going to die, you're going to die. And it was the last thing I needed to hear was him saying to me all the time, you're going to die, you're going to die. And I was trying to stay positive, but I was also in denial. <laughs> Not thinking because I wasn't even allowed to complain, <laughs> you know, and um, and I would always get punished if I complained and even the whole cursing and everything meant whenever I even went to the hospital or the doctor to complain, they would call me a hypochondriac when it was talking about real stuff that was actually going on. So she, she, she dealt out this tough love. Um, which was challenging me. I was desperate for comfort. Like this, I was, I know now that I was literally having my soul pulled out of my body from this grandmaster. And because I had challenged them and I had wanted to talk like an adult to them because I thought, look, you, this is great. Your Qigong's great, but no giving access to chakras. No, 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 no. I was like this, you know, and, um, you know, I was trying to, you know, because they were like my family for a while, this cult. And uh, I was like all about love, and I was like into that. They and um, so when I went into psychosis and I couldn't make it, and I really decided that's it. It's all too hard, and I I can't handle. I've got nowhere safe to live. I've got nothing. There's nothing left for me. I'm no good. My body's not working anymore. Um. I just really desired to leave my body and I went down through the floorboards that I was lying on in the middle of your kitchen floor sobbing and crying and um and I could feel the tugging of my spirit as it went through the floorboards and down into the dust and all the mustiness which smells almost again like that musty hellish smell a little bit it reminds me of that and I don't know I think I was on the floor for a couple of hours crying and uh, um and she was she just went off and did her own thing because she seriously seemed to believe that I was fading everything and pretending and um and I managed to get myself out, you know, if I could rest my spine for a while, the paralysis would drop back a little bit. <laughs> so, but I managed to get out, like I got myself, I pulled myself along and then I popped myself up on furniture and I got myself outside because I desperately needed to urinate and I was really scared of doing it on the floor and getting into more trouble. <laughs> I was like, way back in my two-year-old I had no sense of agency me I had gone I wasn't there I didn't know what to do and I just went and I 
you know, leave myself. And then I went and lay down on this bed in this little cabin and, it, you know, had been pouring and the river was swollen and flooded. And and I, um, I was just lying there. And I was just so devastated and couldn't believe what was going on. I was terrified. I had no presence of mind. Scared of the police, couldn't even call the police. Um, and then I started to find a lot of comfort in planning my death. And um, and it wasn't that hard. I could just get myself down to the river. If I got myself into the river, I wouldn't have been able to resist. And I would have been able to leave my body in minutes. But when I was doing my journey therapy with Marie the other day, talking to this man at the fire and he has to tell the truth I found that if I had committed suicide in that moment he would have gained my soul so here he was trying to pull my soul out of my body and this is the stuff that you can't talk to about everybody because it just sounds ridiculous people don't get this um and this is, again, it's like this blackballing Masonic effect where you've got no home, no comfort. You know, like she didn't even feed me. It. <laughs> you know, like I didn't have any food all that day, you know, and, and it had all started. The whole thing started because I just asked for a bit of food. I just said I need some comfort and I couldn't really move around or get off the chair. And so, you know, I was going through my mind and I thought the only thing I need to take care of is my daughter, who I love. And um, I knew she'd be devastated, but I knew she also had the most amazing friends and flatmates and that she'd make it right. And it was really a choice that I did I want to carry on suffering like this. You know, this is where I was going. And I don't know if it... She, it got called psychosis I don't know if it's psychosis I don't really care what what it is but I was definitely not myself and um you know and I and I thought yeah no I'm I'm, I'm ready I, I I can do this I can do this and I was really it was so attractive it was so alluring it's the closest I've ever been and and then this woman comes out and she's angry as anything. And she's standing there at the doorway and she's saying, this is all your fault. This is all your fault. And that's the programming. When you're in those rituals, you're told or somehow you get the message. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. And that's all you hear. And here she was spouting off exactly the, the core belief, the core Heart, heart thing you know and then she said don't you go committing suicide don't you do that to me she said and I didn't tell her I was thinking about it um but it was enough it was actually enough for me to not do it and so that would be the thing I'm most grateful to her for on that day and also the fucking great big wake up call that I was really, really in denial that I, I had nowhere safe. I didn't have anywhere to put my memories. There was no one I could talk to. And I was getting triggered left, right and centre by other survivors, especially the ones that were more finding their healing in churches and went, oh no, oh no, they're just taking people straight back to, to the abusers. Because in my mind, it was, it was. Because I wasn't able to be rational at that time either. Like now I can see this beautiful survivor over here has had so much love and support by genuine, loving, spiritual people. And I'm, oh my God, I'm so grateful to those people for helping that survivor, you know. And then this survivor over here, she talks about the angels that carried her through all of her life and how they've always been with her and they've never left her, you know. And that's something, in, again, I couldn't go through because I got burnt by this whole, when people say, I'm sending Archangel Michael, and then I'd get attacked, you know. 
and because it's not always that and I don't like the word art because it's art it means over archon and um and I think there's there's like everything has got extremes um but but the main thing I have been looking for all my life is what the heck is this place why is it such a hell and how do we get out of here and so that caused me to seek and seek and seek and ask and ask and ask and it led me to the sacred mind calendar now the mind calendars have a really really bad rap because it was made new age by a man called Jose Aguilaris who I believe was a CIA a plant I don't know for sure this is just from things you hear and pick up from others but I'm not saying it's true this is how it it's come together for me because he he also went to the Vatican to try and get this dream spell calendar which he called the Mayan calendar reformulated the dates put it around the moon he went to the Vatican to try to get approval for that the Mayan elders never you want gave me to bring up the graphic while you're talking about it. Yes. Okay, keep going. Yes, yes, thank you. So what happened was I got drawn into that because I was picking up the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar, there's something in the Mayan calendar for me. But I got draw, brought into the infiltrated one first because it was portrayed as the Mayan calendar. And then someone one day challenged me and said, no, 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 that's not the sacred mind calendar. Get in touch with this guy, Sean Caulfield. You see his name on here. And so this is the graphic. So he became my mentor for um, the mind calendar, which after I got more familiar with the true calendar, I started to teach on it. And then Dr. Carl Kellerman, who did a lot of research and he, he, formulated and put together these cycles these grand eras of time now I don't 100% agree with everything on here um the way that it is written because I don't I don't somewhere it looked like we come from apes I don't actually necessarily see that I just think there might have been dinosaur times there might have been others we don't actually know we weren't there but what I what I learned from this is that if you see right up at the very top where your little hand thing is, yep, uh, it, starting in the 9th of March 2011 and all of this time and then coming into that, that time of um, the solstice on the 2012, uh, which was as our summer solstice in the south, it's your winter solstice in the north was a time when humanity was going to have a lot of big changes in their consciousness. And even there, you can see that with each level that we go up, time quickens 20 times each time, but we go back into this frontal lobe, which is like the, the you know, it's almost like the two hemispheres of the brain are knitting <laughs> together. It's the frontal lobe. It's not the reptilian brain, which you see in the, peritial lobe which you know had some really hard times in it but anyway so Dr Carl Kellerman encouraged me and it was actually for his book he wanted to write a book and he wanted me to look into the nine day codes um, that come with this calendar because he said look we think there's codes in here and will you look into that and report back to me and I started reporting back to him but then he got nasty to me about something made some false accusations which is another thing that can happen and so I thought well no I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to just report on these codes because this is for everything I don't make any money out of this this is sacred knowledge everybody needs to know what we're going through so I, I actually report on the sacred Mayan energies and this to me is the most amazing thing because this is what I see as the function of the heavenly father is he produces those energies every day for us to evolve by I call it the seeds of time but it's not chronological or chronos time which comes from Saturn which is a harnessed and controlled time which the Satanists go to so in our evolution 
humanity has gone through different stages. So if we go back down to the sixth level, that started in 3115 BC, which is called the National Underworld. So that was like, well, in here when Sean put this graph together, it was 5,125 years ago. This was the start of the, its first writing. And this is where I discovered that calendar systems and what is written. And so the writ in word has a lot to do with black magic spell casting and what I would call reptilian um, technology because it comes from outside of this world. And then you'll see in the Old Testament when people look at they study that and they look at things to do with Anunnaki and all that sort of stuff. It's in there. So this era, before it, humanity was experiencing their world and their surroundings. Again, they were in this frontal lobe. Everything was in unity. They were in connection with the earth. They were in connection with the nature. They would have been aware of these energies because they would have been more telepathic. They would have been they would have been in tune because they were they were connected with themselves and they were connected with the earth and you know it would have been a more peaceful time and then we come into 3115 bc and as that takes hold the left brain half is of the brain is favored and that's where the patriarchy came in so it's been a man's world for how long um, where, you know, women have been oppressed, suppressed, especially like in, in the Muslim women that have to cover up. And if they're raped, they get stoned to death because they got raped, you know, that kind of thing. That's an example. But when the written word came in, um, the first thing that I'm aware of that started was the Babylonian slave driving system. So people started to be captured and used and whipped. You know, they'd have all the Roman century people that were, you know, making these slaves work and build structures and under, you know, terrible conditions. And then that evolved to, we'll give them gold if they do a certain amount. And that be developed the money system. And then the money system went further until right we get to this time and all that money is heaped up to very very few and they are actually the ones that seem to be reptilian overall and a lot of people know what that means and some people it's going to sound very crazy too so that era happened then but what actually happened was the mind got captured by science and this is where religion came in Okay, so like you and I, um, Emma, we have a spirituality. It's different from religion. When religion, what religion can do, and it can do it a lot with the words, is it binds and it holds things and structures and people get control. And, oh, yeah, and, you know, like even in that, you know, there's a lot of truth in the Christian Bible and there's a lot of deceit as well from what I've seen. But one of those truths is let no man come between you and your heavenly father. <laughs> but that's what they do. And what that's what religions do. You have to go through the Pope. You have to go through the priest. You have to, you know, and then they use this for nefarious purposes and blackmail and who's who and all that sort of thing. So this Christianity and all of these other religions actually came and they took a hold and they took a hold on the whole consciousness of the earth and you know the whole thing about um what's written on the new on the sorry the US dollar bill in God we trust okay well that's obviously not what most people think is God like a a good creator type God that's to me that's that satanic God who's heaping all the money and going through the, you know, Federal Reserve and all of these sorts of things. Because before this time, none of these things featured in humanity. Um, and so this was almost like where it came in, like a grip. So the Native American people, have you ever heard of Wetico? So, so Wetico, 
is they describe it as a sickness of the mind. I'm just going to read it. It's an evil cannibalistic spirit that can take over people's minds, leading to selfish, selfishness, insatiable greed, and consumption as an end in itself, destructively turning our intrinsic creative genius against our humanity. So, well, you know, this is, to me, this is where the slavery and sickness and all of this stuff came in. And, you know, like on the outside, a lot of religions, they look wonderful. They look like wonderful places you can go and you can have belonging and family and all of that. But then you get into so much of it only to discover that it's actually um, another form of Satan worship where people are competing and being greedy. Tithing is another thing, you know. First of all, you have to give a whole lot of money to taxes, and then they also want you to tithe, you know. So it's like all of that um, is that harnessing and that taking. And then, so, you know, like like these energies come through the sun. And so our consciousness, human consciousness, creates our reality. So massive, great, big trauma came in at this time I have my own past life memory of how this came in which I call the decline before that there was harmony I believe I had a Mayan past life we knew that this time was coming we dreaded it we knew the cycle was coming and that it had to happen and again for me in that past life it was a ritual it was traumatic the man was made to to watch couldn't defend the woman the break between uh, the, the female and the male, division, separation, all those, those things came in. And that's been a process. And so, you know, then we go into the other areas, eras, you know, AD 1755, that's a pretty big year for the United States, I think. But that's when um, industry started and factories and the earth started to get massively polluted even more. Um, and the internet came in, so AI started to come in, which is another big threat, which I believe is connected to Satanism as well. Um, and then we went, uh, we went up in 1999 to the galactic underworld, you know, the economic collapse. And this was a time where truth was starting to come out. You've got the truthers, the truth movements, the adamant, you know, I was a truther. I was an activist and then I worked out I was hating and dividing and um, and that's it and, and David Icke's another one. Um, Jeanette Archer has just released something um, where she she discloses how David Icke who knows everything about the reptilian is actually a, a grandmaster and has used people in ritual and that part of the whole thing is that the Illuminati or the Masonics they always have to disclose their truth to the public that's part of what they do. They have to be informed. And so, you know, that got me well, asking, well, what's David Icke's agenda then? And then his whole thing is you've got to stand up, you've got to fight, we've all got to fight. So again, that's splitting, that's fighting. They love that energy. They want that energy. And like for me, the way that I see that humanity progresses and moves forward is by being the love, being the truth, doing the inner work, healing the trauma, um, and every time we heal the trauma, like for example, when I was dealing with Ilchi Lee in that recent journey, we're talking, I'm gaining information, there's honesty, and um, and then it's like, well, Ilchi Lee, this is Marie, <laughs> I'm channeling Marie here, well, Ilchi Lee, do you really like, do you know that you've also been a pawn? do you can you see how you've also been used and you know she's talking and it's like somewhere in some area this is happening and registering and and it's actually about bringing him into a place where he can do better and and raise his frequency and, and not be doing that harm anymore I mean I don't it somehow it works but at some stage when I started to really see into 
those dimensions because I've seen a lot into that fourth dimension and the horrors and the terrible beings that are there and the demons and the everything that goes on there. Um, you get I get to see a whole nother world. So we we're living in a multi-dimensional thing. And so, you know, we see with our 3D, because I've got these strange glasses, they're actually filters, um, because I I see energy at the same time and it just cuts out all the shadowy and you know it, it means I can just get around and see and not fall over all the time because I have a lack of depth perception without these classes and um yeah so you can actually move things on to a higher thing which is really what that is what love is it's not about vengeance you know this woman who has been atrocious and been very abusive towards me she was used she was a pawn and she got possessed and it's always the host that comes through the person. You know, like I used to, when I was a counsellor, I used to love counselling because I could see the person's soul, no matter what they were going through. Like I could have a prostitute in front of me. I could see her beautiful soul. And this is what I used, we used to work on drawing out. You know, it would be part of the counselling process. I felt very fortunate that I could see that beautiful soul, not what they were doing, not what they were struggling with, you know, but their potential and how they might be able to get themselves free of, of things. And um, and this is where I, I just believe that the love and the truth and the unity comes in. And, you know, like I find I'm laughing a lot more now and I laugh because I still stumble around on my words because I'm still blocked a bit in the throat and I end up sort of saying funny words at funny times. I just laugh at myself and I don't edit it and I just let it be, you know, because it's human. And, you know, like in my church times and in my spirituality and everything, there's been a big emphasis on denying the human body. But then... Our body can, it's like, like it, we have the earth and she has all knowledge with inside of her. Like when you really get to know the spirit of the earth, which I mean, because I spent so much time with her as a little child, like she spoke to me and different things in nature kept me going. I sort of became close to her and then I got scared, witless away from her and then came back to her. But she holds all knowledge of everything in her being. I mean, new age people would call it Akashic Records. I don't, I'm not happy with that. It's not not me personally, but it's okay. People can have that if they want. But to me, the earth holds all knowledge. And it's also in the Mayan, um, in the Mayan understanding, earth is also the word for knowledge. And and then what we are, we are made up of the same stuff. And then I realized my body has all knowledge and it's absolutely true because when I go on these journeys to try and heal and access the trauma, I go to the cells and the pain and the, the sickness and my body is showing me what happened um, when I connect up the feelings, like guided, I've been guided. It was too hard for me to do it on my own. Um, I can do little bits on my own now. And it used to be a practice I used in my own therapy sessions, but as when I was um, a retreat facilitator. But Marie, yeah, it, you go into the body and the body tells you everything and all knowledge was in our body. So every human being, it's almost like we are told it's carnal. <laughs> it's um, that the body is nothing and you're actually a spirit in that body. And well, actually, the body matters a lot. And, and the thing that I've learned a lot about the Mayan system and the Mayan calendar and Mayan way is that every facet of life is covered. We've got a balance. There needs to be a balance between the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, and the physical, all equally balanced. Like one of the days that we have is the deer, and that means that each 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 hoof of the deer is balanced in all four directions. So um, like the modern day Mayan people of the actual culture, they still teach it. But, you know, unfortunately, over time, a lot gets lost. So 
I have been so um, incapacitated physically for so long. I've only had me and, and my body and my breath and my meditation to go to. So I got to get to know myself really well because it's all I had. And I stopped looking at all the outer information. I just wanted to know what was true from the inside, you know, which is why I've also, you know, found the traumas and found what happened. And, um, you know, I believe that there's a whole team of us, and you included Emma, um, that are helping to break this, to break it down and, and save the children and to, to, to stop it from happening and to also help the ones that are still suffering to to rise up because I've I've literally had to rise up from the bottom, you know, with, with no money, getting a very meager benefit, um, not having love around me. I mean, I have a, a lovely landlady, but we keep our boundaries and you know, I can't just talk about this to to regular people, even though she's not regular, but you know, um so I've been living in my own place for quite a few months now, which actually allowed the healing to really come through because I just was always around other people and was just lost in them. I I was programmed to only give love out and I didn't know how to give love to myself. And I've only just learned. I mean, in a way I did. But I've only just learned that I'm actually worthy of my own love. Yes, you are. You <laughs> love others. Yeah. So you are. You're so worthy of it. And your knowledge is just incredible. I love like exploring all of this. You know, I think people get so stuck in a bubble of like a belief that they block out everything else. And I think even if your beliefs don't change, it's so good to know what else other people believe because like you said, this stuff is used in these systems. Like there are people that use this knowledge against children. They time things with calendars, dates, numbers, astrological uh, positioning of planets or yeah. moons, like whatever it is, solstice, like all this stuff is very important to the enemy. And we block it out because we're like, oh, it doesn't fit my belief system. And it's like, okay, well, this is why this is going to keep happening to kids because we're not taking the time to understand it. Like there is too much to like maybe believe all of it. Like we do need to use discernment and like pick and choose what works for us, of course, but understanding that there's people that do have these beliefs and believe them 100% and use them yeah. to people. Like we need to know all of this, you know? And I think it brings to light, like just these really beautiful elements of how beliefs can be so layered, you know, that there's so much to a, a thought or a concept, even love. Like you look at love, yeah. how that, is something that no matter what religion you are, no matter what race you are, no matter your economic class, like love can be something that is available to you in your life. It exists in almost every single type of text, right? Like it crosses these different planes, but it can have these different meanings depending on who the person is, depending on their interpretation of it, you know, but we bond with people over understanding different belief systems and then bringing into us like our own interpretation of it right? But there's so many different things that cross over into religions and cross over into different belief systems. And I think they yeah. offer layers. I don't think that it's necessarily always having to choose between this and that. I think we can pick a belief and say, how, what are the different layers to this across our, our universe, across the world? What was God's understanding of it? What is mother earth's understanding of it? What is my understanding of it? My partner's understanding of it, right? Like there's my neighbor or somebody in a different country, you know, I think mm -hmm. that there's just so many really beautiful ways that we can take like ancient knowledge and the knowledge of today and understand it in more of like a, uh, a four dimensional way instead of like a 2d way that so many people look at <laughs> yeah. like yeah. run away everything else or anybody else that thinks different, you know, like, I think this is all so fascinating to learn, yeah. you know, just what, like the history of this, you know, and you lay out this calendar that goes back so long showing like how all of these things are tied into satanic ritual abuse and how it's tied into the things that we're seeing done today, you know, and yeah. realizing that, that there's a history behind this that goes back so many years 
sure it's evolved and sure technology has come in and, and sure there's all these different, you know, elements to it that have probably changed to improve it over time, make it faster, um, more systematic, whatever it is. But like being able to see on a grand scheme that this isn't new, like there's nothing new under the sun, you know, like <laughs> this, is, this is stuff that has existed for a long time in different ways. And all of these things come into play, the numbers and the dates and the calendars and the different beliefs. Right. Yeah, so we were just talking about the ritual dates. Um, okay, now for any survivor and for many, many, many people, Christmas, New Year, Halloween, um, Easter can be hell. Birthday, <laughs> and, Passover. Oh. Mm, that's right. That's right. So, um, it would always come up and I I have had to take myself away and not be around people because I'll just be, I can be a hysterical mess at those times. Um, someone usually comes and spends Christmas with me, which makes all of the difference. Um, and, but, you know, now that emotional charge, I can still see this, different, well, there's emotional charge in there, but I'm still actually being able to tell my story without being, you know, but a lot of the emotional charge is coming out. But, but yeah, those dates, um, like Christmas is particularly, I find it incredibly hard because people, everyone goes around and they all going, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> and it becomes a worldwide chant. And happy new year and happy easter these become chants and there's word magic that i see involved in all of that so at the very same time all this is going on and people are drinking and celebrating and children are being left to their own devices these are actually the times of the year where terrible terrible rituals are happening to babies and children and it's kind of like the energy of the celebration is actually going into the energy of the rituals and the word ritual the writ so this era came in with the writ and word and this to me was like black magic spell casting and we all know like people that are awake or aware they know that we know we have to be careful with what we say and what we write and what we do put out there because things materialize and um so what happens is you have these calendar so you've got the mayan calendar now they tried to destroy the Maya and everything to do with them, their records, their temples and all of that because they were really a threat to their system. So if you look at the Vatican, um, even its geo, what do you call it, all its buildings and everything are set up similar to a Mayan structure. But what they did was I think they, first of all, they had the Julian calendar um, which was after a Roman Julius Caesar, I think. So they brought in this calendar, which basically the whole world was going to keep time by. It wasn't, it, so this actually removed, this became a time construct. So, yes, yes, Vatican City, yes, <laughs> that's it. So it became a, um, they made false time constructs and then they created the Gregorian calendar, which again was from the Vatican and it came through one of the popes. Can't remember which one now, but these calendars became the calendars that basically the whole world runs off now. And, you know, like we have to plan, you know, we live in different countries. So I'm like, 
I don't know, 17 hours ahead of you, like the day before, but five hours behind, that kind of crazy stuff. And Dr. Carl Kellerman, I asked him about that. He said it was to do with the shipping, trading, merchanting with ships, and they created the Greenwich Mean Time, which was so that they could basically do commerce around the earth. And and then what I find is that one of the first things that came in in that sick wave era was the Greek gods, and all the planets were named after Greek gods. Um, Saturn was actually named after Satan. Um, but the god of Saturn is called Kronos, also known as Father Time and Chronological Time. And this is like a trapping and a binding that has kept people in like a, um, a time trap. And then what happens is they do the rituals on certain days when the astrology is a certain way. So astrology started to come out of the Greek god stuff the astrology that's written now and now that really takes precedence when people look at like oh what's the future going to bring and what are the energies all astrology they go to astrology but if you look at it even astrology it's all about oppositions it's all about your love life it's about your career it's about all of these mindsets which fit around com capitalism and commercialism and and all this sort of stuff um and so that affects human consciousness to stay there. Um, what I know about the Mayan calendar is it can actually bring us back into our humanity and our connection with our creator. And to be a creative force with the womb of creation, Earth. So um, that's there. So then you've got ritual dates on Easter, whatever. And then what I discovered because of what happened to me is that then they can empower black magic spell casting legislation on the top of the blood of children. So that's what I believe happened to me and why I was used and why my parents or my mother was pursued from England through the Rothschild line. And I was used as a colonizing ritual. And it was a Maori woman who was killed and whose blood got put on me. And I've had this real draw towards Maori people and the Maori ways. I love the native ways of every land because I'm so sensitive. I feel the land, you know, I feel her. And one of the first things she said to me was a Maori phrase which was kanohi kiti kanohi, which means face to face. It means we're face to face, you know. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so a lot of the native cultures and many lands have still held that truth. And like the Hopi and the Navajo, they're direct descendants of the Maya, and so are the Maori. And then they even see themselves going back to similar star systems because we realize that we're from the stars, a lot of people. Um, and then you get all kinds of infiltration. People know that like everything that is truth gets an infiltration put on it. So then you get all these star seeds that don't want to be here and don't want to have anything to do with Earth and I want to go home and they're waiting for the, you know, they're waiting for uh, the spaceships to come and take them away you know, which is a terrible, terrible threat because I do see that that's a plan. It's a plan for reptilians to come and take humans off the earth and have another slave race somewhere doing whatever. So these are the things I get to see, but I see very, very, very big pictures. Um, yeah, no, I can always happy to explain more. <laughs> But that's how I see the how the calendars, so the, the legislation sits on top of the calendar systems and it's all to do with consciousness. So everything 
you know, our consciousness are very governed by these things. Like everyone goes, happy Christmas, Merry New Year, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Easter, Happy New Year. Oh, it's not New Year for me. Oh, when's it New Year for you? I don't care when it's New Year. Every day is a day. I'm writing them now, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, but, you know, I've been so ridiculed and humiliated and put down. I guess this is all part of that blackballing effect, which I've been just throwing off and throwing off and throwing off um, just with all the, with all the healing of, of the trauma. And I know, I know with all of my heart, our way back is with love and truth. <laughs> and true time, true time is, is truth. <laughs> and love, you know, like, and that's who I want to be. That's what I, that's what I see a new era that is possible for a whole lot of people but again, you know, what do you hear in the new age movement? Oh, this is an ascension symptom. You're going to have this, you're going to have that. How about, what about doing your work? What about doing, releasing your trauma? It's like everything is, this is all happening to you. It's all from the outside, you know, and it paralyzes people to do nothing. Oh, I'm just going to wait till this eclipse and something's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen with this eclipse, but I know over in the US, you're getting all kinds of warnings to, stock up on food and all sorts because I think there might be a plan coming in from the so-called elites and there could be a fake Jesus thing you know they know how to now get all these holographic images and the whole sky's become metallic it's become like a big movie screen and there are bodies and there are things that are in the sky that weren't there that are here because we are in a big big change of a cycle so you'll get all these a lot of people that are going to be absolutely terrified thinking right now we're we're totally going we're going to be totally taken over by ai and you know this new world order would would have people believe that and and that's fear you know we'll just keep everybody in the fear and what is that opposite to fear it is love and you know i want to love even though i could be putting my life at risk except I know I'm so amazingly protected like you are, I just, um, I choose to tell us. I choose to tell us it's time. And, you know, my prayers are all, if it's going to be really dangerous or it's going to be really harmful, make it change, make it stop. And that's come into effect many times. There's been times I've arranged to do this or that, the other thing, and it's been nipped in the bud. And I go, thank you. Thank you for protecting me. But now I'm getting clearer, like the more I do my trauma release and the more I remember and the more I see, the more my um, innate human gifts come back. And we all have them and we can all get back to them. And, you know, like um, that we need to know ourselves. And this is like, don't deny this human body. It's a vessel that we have been given. It's our superpower. <laughs> you know, like it's got all this memory in it. It's got all this guidance in it, intuition. It's got this will that pours out. Keep your chakras safe. <laughs> you know, gosh, did I learn a, a, a terrible, terrible, you know, a harsh lesson. But, um. You know, and this is why I need to say these things. And I've had people from New Age, shut up, shut up, don't say it, put your story behind you, you should be over that, or oh, you're just such a victim. And um, look, I have been messy. I know I've been messy. <laughs> and then that, you know, that other part of me, that saboteur, saboteur would come through a part, you know, all these parts of me. And then there's be the real kick-ass part that's trying to <laughs> defend myself. I love that. I love the psychologist that comes on your show. He's amazing. I love his energy. I love the way he talks. He really helped me understand myself more. Um, but, yeah, we get fragmented and we have to literally pull ourselves together, which we do in the body. Well, for me, it's in the body, by the body. You know, like I can feel the parts that are still healing, the parts, you know, there's still blockages and stuff around my head and my neck. Um, and I will allow it to talk to me. So in some ways I've become more embodied into my physicality than a regular person on the street. And here I am, I've been so fractured out of my body. 
Yeah, because that sodomy actually splits the brain. It splits it and you cannot function. So I have complex PTSD. I can be triggered. I can be triggered and I might not know that I'm triggered. And then if someone who loves me is around me, they might be able to say, hey, Poppy, what's going on? But I might not actually see it for a while and I might just carry on and um, making things worse. So I have to be very, very self-aware um, and, you know, I'm doing the best I can, absolutely the best I can. And I added the name Joy to my name <laughs> because it was an aspiration. It's what I wanted to become and I think I'm finally becoming it, finally. Yeah, and you your affair has just been lovely, just lovely. You are. Your name makes me so happy, Poppy Joy. That's such a sweet name. I love it. It fits you so well. Yeah, and Poppy as well, you know. It's yeah. quite funny. So happy. Because I can get quite passionate, you know, and I now I've started to be a lot less hard on myself. And so when sometimes I get real passionate, you know, I say, oh, that was a Poppy Pop passion drop. <laughs> And I even bought myself a tin whistle the other day because I'm a whistleblower. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. That is so cute and significant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five dollars and I have, you know, I have like, I live on next to nothing. And um, Oh my gosh. Yeah, but you know, that whistle, yeah, I was actually looking for it before I almost, oh, there it is. Oh, I really want to do this. <laughs> So yeah, can, go ahead. Look, I'm dressed for the occasion. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That is so cute. <laughs> I want to do this. So I just want to do this because this is like a passion, you know. Do it. Like, <laughs> you know, please do what you can to save the children. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing my bit. Em's doing her bit. We're all doing our bit. You know. Oh my gosh, I need a whistle now. I need to go get one. I love that. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Whistleblowers yeah. Alliance. <laughs> yeah. and we it is the way out, you know. We have to have so many numbers, so many numbers that we keep each other safe. Because yes. when, when one or two out in front, they're not safe. Oh my gosh, the things Jeanette Archer has had to go through, the amount of arrests, you know, all of this. She got arrested outside that Exbury Rothschild estate, the one that, you know, my mother, you know, grew up by. Yeah, in the war. She grew up in the war. My mum grew up in the war. But, you know, I, I feel such camaraderie, such with all the survivors, everyone that I, I listen to. Um, I still haven't listened to many because I'm so in my own memories but I love your show and I love the way that it's done um yeah yeah it's just so safe mm. it's an honor to get to do this you know it's like you said I don't think you or anybody wants to step up and do this like why would you want to talk about this stuff it's like probably the last thing that you try to think about during the day and talk about and there comes a point and this is like what I've really honed in with survivors and like some of the biggest lessons that I've taken, like life is so much bigger than us. And we are so conditioned, like everyday people where we're like, oh my gosh, I can't put a post out unless everything's spelled perfect. I have to look perfect in my posts. My life has to look perfect, you know, and, th and that's not it. Like we don't contribute anything to healing the planet by just saying everything's cool. Everything's fine. And even yeah. if you haven't gone through like extreme trauma, like what you have, like the one thing that does bring us together is the hard times in life. Like the, when we look back at our life, we don't always think about the best things. I mean, sometimes we do, but I think what, what really stands out are the really horrible things who helped us through that and what we learned and who we became through forging through that, the person we yeah. became on the other side. And I just yeah. think Poppy, it is so amazing. Like it sends chills down my spine hearing these horrible things that you went through. And like, it makes me want to cry just to even think about it. Like you are so precious and to think about anybody Anybody mm -hmm. trying to hurt you, it just, it tears my heart apart in ways that I can't even explain. It makes me want to cry, you know, but yeah. seeing how you somehow, you go through all that, you have all these years of torment, people betraying you. Like you said, you didn't have friends next to you. You didn't have a support system of people that loved you for most of your life. Yet somehow you understand love 
on a deep yeah. fundamental way that's that most people who have had it in their lives their whole lives take for granted ignore and like never soaked in and like actually contemplated you know like yeah. I learned so much about love from you and other survivors and it just blows my mind how how you've went through so many horrible things and like that's the lesson that you learned on the other side of that was Hey, the answer is love. Like that's what we're missing in this world is connecting and uniting with each other. You know, like when we realize how many things are put in our way to divide us from people, we forget that like the war isn't between this religion and that religion, this race and that race, like that ain't it. It is all of us against anybody who wants to hurt children. Like yeah. that is the battle that we're facing. It's a, it's a battle between literal people who want to save children and people who don't, you know? Yeah. And like, that's always what this brings me back to is like, we need to be more loving. Like when we're loving and authentic and we put all of our stuff on the table and we're like, Hey, like, I'm not perfect. Like I'm, and I'm not going to pretend to be like, I went through hard things. Like that's what makes me a human. That's what makes somebody say, wow, I'm not alone. It's not yeah. seeing the perfect post on Instagram. That makes people feel very alone to be like, well, my life looks in shambles. Like I can't yes. sleep at night. I can't function during the day. Like I don't feel beautiful. I have pimples all over my yeah. face. And like I'm just seeing all this perfect stuff online. Like these stories, yeah. what you're sharing, and I know that the, it's so hard to share what you did, but you sharing all this today, there's people listening, Poppy, that don't feel alone right now because of you. Yeah. And you yeah. realize that it's so much bigger than you, that like you speaking out, it's not be it's not because it's gonna change your past. It's because it's going to change who you are as a person to get it out, knowing that the people on the other side are going to be able to take your puzzle piece, put it in the puzzle and say, aha, like, I don't feel alone anymore. Or, wow, that aligned with me. Or maybe this will help parents protect their children. Maybe it'll help somebody, you know, be aware that this could be happening or want to, you know, take action somehow. And like, I just want to commend you for that because you are such a beautiful person. Like you, joy mm -hmm. is exactly how I feel when I'm around you. Like you have this beautiful energy. You make me like uplifted, even hearing about these horrible things. I just feel your heart and like your passion for just wanting to do right. And like genuine love for humanity and like wanting to share these horrible things to try to make the mm -hmm. world better and to try to educate people. And I just can't thank you enough, Poppy. Like you are just such a beautiful person that I treasure. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just so lovely to have met you and, and, um, yeah, yeah. And love is it. And, and that support of coming around people in the hard times, that is the love. That is the love. Yes. I was saying, uh, I think it was yesterday. I said something about, you know, survivors like are risking their lives to come share and like, there's no art, like there's a whole army against you to do it. And there's not an army behind you supporting you. Like we need to be more yeah. firm with like realizing where the battle is and like getting behind the, the warriors that are on the front lines like you and being like, Hey, you mess with Poppy. Like you're messing with me. You know, that's like, <laughs> yeah. that's like where my yeah. stance is now. Like I am so protective over like everybody in this community, you know, and it's like, we all need to do that as humans. Like we need to come stand behind the people who are trying to make the world better. And like, yeah. I feel like survivors are going to save the world. That's what I feel. I feel like yeah. people were anointed to come here and like show us how to make the world better because yeah. you the absolute worst things. And so you also understand like the complete polarity of it and how to heal the world. Yeah. And we come across, we want to collaborate. We want people to know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, but I feel it. I feel it. It's like, that no person's more special than anybody else. We're all equals here. Let's nurture one another's souls. Like once this money system is going through whatever it's going through, one day I don't know how things will be, but if we can come back to this time of equality, you know, like everything is here. Everything is direct. You say nature is abundantly providing. She's just been so terribly polluted. And, you know, people hate her because she's been polluted and she's she's trying to get it off her, you know. And um, and people go, oh, you know, the earth is ferocious and all of that. Well, she's just responding. And I'll tell you what, I've been ferocious at times when I, you know, like, like, like 
if you got to see some of the language that comes out in these journey therapies, when you express your feelings, like you need to express all the true feelings that are there that are connected with that cellular memory that's coming out, you know, you will, what I'm calling Yochi Lee in those moments is not, you know, and, and this person and that person, but you go through all of that process, you hear back from their soul, you get through, you know, you hear until you get to this point where I can forgive them from the younger me and from the present me. And that forgiveness is ultimately for me. It means, oh, I'm not hating you anymore. There's no more hate left. I don't want to hate on anybody. And this is the whole illusion of, of even what David Icke is putting out there. It's kind of like, he's still, well, you've got to hate on it all. You know, you've got to stand up for your rights and uh, but it's all hate. And so we have all these people in sovereign movements, which I was a part of, and activists I was a part of. I've been a part of all of these things. I even got involved in politics, oh, you know, and it's all division, division, division. It's all about hating on and blaming and pushing it away. But do we heal doing that? No, we have to take responsibility. I've got my lot and this is what I got to sort out. And everybody's got their lot. There's no need for racism. There's no need for this competition that's been going on around the whole world. Like just like, like how much blood is on Mother Earth's ground? You think of the people in Africa that are suffering and like here they are in the breadbasket and and the starvation is, is terrible and the intertribal wars and everything that happens when people are trauma-based, mind-controlled to be in opposition to one another. 100% yeah. copy and it's going to take people like you helping people like me understand this, you know, because the world isn't what what many of us grew up thinking it was, you know, and it's it's hard facing the truth because it's painful. But in the end, it sets us free, you know, and I know like all of this has been so hard for me to learn. But ultimately, I feel so much better navigating the world because I feel like I understand the world that we live in better. And is it the world that I thought? No. Is it as glamorous as I thought it was? No. But now I see the potential of how can we get it to be that way? Because it was, even when I thought it was good, it wasn't. Like I realize now that like all the consumerism and the, like I said, picture perfect stuff that like we get excited to post about, you know, like it, we're, we have this manufactured Truman show type reality, you know, and we really have to pull ourselves out of that and be like, let's just, if, you know, these evil people want that to be their world, like we're going to give it to them. And like, we need to all step to the side and like create a better world. You know, like we need to overcome what they're doing and like get their world out of existence. We need to stop participating in it. We need to stop voting for these people. We need to stop going to these concerts. We need to stop, you know, just being in these positions of louche, like you said, you know, giving yeah. our energy to things like holidays. I stopped celebrating holidays a couple of years ago because I was like, what are they doing on holidays? Are you yeah. like, I automatically saw like the ritual aspect of it yeah everybody like yeah. Putting their energy into these days and like ultimately where it goes at night when these kids are out at you know these ritual sites and I was like uh-uh like I cannot believe that I didn't realize that you know and it's like yeah. not that I'm against people wanting to come together to celebrate things but I think understanding what we're celebrating and that we can create other holidays and we can create other special yeah. events that are not you know yeah uh, contributing to something really evil and that we're not giving our energy yeah. to to evil things yeah. like that's yeah, like, you sort of like take our power back you know yeah like like it, they do they have these days you know like oh woman's day oh what we only get one day out of the whole year actually I want to celebrate being a woman every day yes, you know exactly. now, now I've come to terms and loving my femininity you know whatever it is that we want to celebrate because other people want to celebrate different things but yeah. why not all the time why not every day like this whole thing is like we all just keep getting pulled apart you know like yeah and it's it's just you know govern means um control and meant means mind so it literally means mind control and you know like I, I just did a little <laughs> video the other day and I called it the 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 greatest sci, uh, psychological operation ever on, on earth I call it the greatest psychological um, operation on earth yeah 
And is that on yeah. your YouTube channel that you did that? Yeah, it's actually the last one that I did. It's a little okay. bit, it was actually before the journey and my throat was a bit closed and I was a bit fumbling over words, but I don't care. I still got the message out there. <laughs> Let me bring up your YouTube channel. I would love for people to follow you there. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel and, uh, you know, just where people like what your handle is and, and what it's about and where how people can support you. Well, yeah, like I don't have many places of support now. Like um, I did have a website when I couldn't afford to keep it going until it was so shadow banned. I didn't really want to, but this is really shadow banned. I have people that say, oh, look, I'm subscribed to you. And, and then I don't even get a notification. Um, me too on my channel. Right. Right. Yeah, yes. They they do that. And do you know they stuff. just made a change in meta on Facebook? Look, I don't actually want to lead people to my Facebook page. It's just because I don't like Facebook at all. And and suddenly now Meta, it, it it's like uh I think they took all the followers away. I don't know, but nothing's happening hardly at all on Facebook, apart from the fact that I did sabotage myself at different times because of the part that was playing out. But um yeah, it, it's just like people don't hear this, they don't see it, and yet I actually feel like what I'm saying, what Jeanette Archer saying like just Jeanette Archer just gave an amazing disclosure um on the way the system works and what she's doing um but it just doesn't and and what she did was she put that out as a live last week I actually got to watch it and then I went to share it and it was gone because they took it down now she's got it out on BitChute and she's referring people there. So she actually managed to save it because it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant what she said. And it would help a lot of people because so many people are getting caught up in all of these psychological operations. And, you know, a whole bunch of people are into this QAnon and Trump. And I was too. My gosh, I got pulled in there too. And then I found out that Trump's tower is a series of 666 black cubes. I didn't know it was 666. My friend who I was talking to, who's MK Ultra and finding out things about herself, said that because she had warned me about David Icke years ago. She said, oh, no, he's a grandmaster. He knows all, all the strategies. But he was started off as a, a sports presenter. And, you know, that's the Illum Illuminati way of doing things. So we have to be very careful about who gets out here and who tells truth. And it's usually highly polished truth, very polished truth. Yeah. Yes, you're so right about that. And I wanted to, your YouTube channel is at Mayan Missions. I want to make sure that I said yeah. that um, for people who aren't looking. Um, and I'll have yeah. that in the show notes for you guys. But Poppy's been starting to post more. I know that this was a big step for you to get back, you know, onto recording and stuff. And you're doing it a lot more consistently now. And I'm so proud of you. You're really good at explaining mm -hmm. things. And you have this really lovely and uplifting energy about you and you're also like playful you know like a lot of the stuff is really heavy and you have you have yes. a way of sort of um you know sharing the hard things but then also sharing the way yeah. that it impacted you today with it and people can sort of see that contrast of like where you were where you are and I think it gives people hope you know and you bring that into these videos too that you do which I really love so I, I love for people to go subscribe to you on YouTube. Um, and I'm guessing you're going to keep posting more videos and, you know, continue this journey. And I hope you do because you're so good at it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really do feel it's, it's vital actual information for every, you know, the, the freedom of those that choose it because it is a choice. It's been a choice to be connected with our source parents, you know, like it's a choice to be one with creation and to be a responsible co-creator by, by by working with our own consciousness yes yeah, 100%. yeah. you know when I was when I was a retreat facilitator I was co-facilitating but you know we had a life coaching program in that part which was my area and everyone you know, people that would come we had one guest at a time we always did quite extensively we looked at we looked into their belief system and I never we never judged their belief system and I never judged their belief system people coming from all kinds of backgrounds or you know people that are gay people that are 
uh, Christian, people that are anything, you know, and all different walks of life. What we were interested in is, is this belief working for you? And that was like, we would examine their beliefs and, and would go, is this belief working for you? Okay, let's okay, let's look at this belief and we'd do breathing session and other things from it. And often they'd go away with a modified belief system. Um, but we'd never say it's wrong, it's bad. You know, like our belief systems, they get here from somewhere and sometimes look I know people that have been alcoholics and you know uh, drug addicts they need often need something for a while they really really need something and if you threaten that belief system their whole life feels threatened so we've got to be careful with each other and I try to be at the same time as disclosing things that could really upset people's belief systems as well but, um, you know, it's always up to people what they believe, whether they do it, or they take it. That's not up to me. I'm not, I'm not saying anyone has to change. I'm just giving some. No, that, that's beautiful. That's like my belief too. You know, I have had people criticize me and be like, this guest isn't Christian or this guest is too Christian or whatever it is. And I'm like, so I should only bring people on my show that like fit either just my exact belief system or your exact belief system. Like we're going to ostracize all survivors and people who went through hard things just because they don't fit exactly our beliefs. Like that is insane. Yeah. And if I were to have designed my show like that, I'd have no guests because I still have not had a single person come on that shares my yeah. exact belief system or anybody that watches my show, their exact yeah. belief system. Like we're all so unique and we all have so much to learn from each other. And I think the more we can like invite all of this in, you know, and I love that you said that too about being compassionate. Cause here's the other thing, right? Like there's some survivors that were abused like you were of with religion and they're just not ready to accept like that vernacular into their life right now. It doesn't mean that they, they won't ever mm -hmm. be there, but we have no. to also accept that everybody's on a different part of their journey. Some people are further along and have gone through and aren't quite as sensitive to things. Some people are still very easily triggered. They're very easily upset Stuff can be really hard for them to hear, you know, or just cringeworthy. Like they, they just can't hear it right now. And so I think yeah. like the more yeah. that we all, like you said, it comes down to love and unity. Like we need to come together and hold each other tight and love each other for what we have become, you know, whether that's this belief system or that, like you said, we all went through something that brought us here and we can all, yeah. our belief systems are changeable. They are uh, ever evolving just because we believe something today doesn't mean that, you know, even tomorrow we'll believe it. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be the same person that we were like, that's what yeah. we should be striving for is to evolve. And people get like, so stuck in this thing, you know, yeah. but at the end of the day, like that is exactly what we have to do is just wrap mm -hmm. our arms around people and say, look, I don't believe the same thing as you. We're not the same person, but like, I love you because I know that you're fighting the same war as me. I know that you went through something hard. I know that we have things in common, you know, and we can put the other stuff aside because what we have in common is way more important than what we don't, you know? Yeah. And like you, you are so gentle with how you do that. And I love it. And I think like we can all learn so much from your example, Poppy. Yeah. It hasn't always been as sweet as it is, as it is now, though. I have to say that because there was getting there, right? yeah, there were times where I was really, really triggered and um and I and I needed to make some real genuine apologies to some people and I did because I believe in doing that if I see that I've done something that hurts something that's unjust then I do want to put it right um you know like none of us are perfect we're all learning we're all evolving and it's like yeah so you know um yeah I I mean <laughs> Um, there was a Christian woman who was wanting to do something for survivors and all within her church. And I was like, okay, what are you teaching? You know, I was like really hard on her. And she was, um, she said, oh, well, if you can get certain people, you can come for free and all that. And but that, that always, you know, doesn't work well for me. But I was actually very hard on her. And I said, what, you're going to send people right back into the place that the abuse comes out of? And I was there at that time, but I'm not now. I'm not now, and I think you know that's been the journey therapy that 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 could take it. And and the other thing was in my illness and my sickness, 
I was starting to have, and I have, I've had brain damage, like from the pressure and everything on my brain. I wasn't even able to rationalize properly for quite a long time. And, and I had a very narrow view for a little while. And I'm just so grateful that it's really opened up now and that I'm back in me. I found myself again. I found my sense of agency again. I've, um, yeah, I've, I've mostly here, you know, and when I'm not, then I need to just take my time out to bring myself back. Yes, yes. And I think too, like, we're no better than these churches that are throwing out SRE survivors, than these medical establishments, these therapists. Like, that's exactly what we do when we say, oh, you are like, you're not allowed to talk about this with me because it doesn't fit what I'm allowed to, you know, take in right now because it goes against my belief system. Like we, if we want churches to accept people, like we have to start setting that example ourselves. We have to start making this a normal conversation and there's nothing normal about it. But like, if we aren't talking about all of this stuff, it's never going to make it into these establishments. It's never going to make it mainstream. Therapists are never going to have an opportunity to learn about it. You know, like we really do have to come together and just say, we're going to throw out every, all of our differences. Let's put everything that, you know, we have in common together and like, let's fight for that because we all have something in common. We all want children to have a better future. We all want to keep the earth safe. We all want survivors to heal and to have resources. And we all want to be here for survivors. You know, we all want the same thing. And it's like, it's so petty how we get just caught up in like, oh, well, I want the same thing as you, but you vote Democrat and I vote Republican, so we can't talk. You know, there's just like these little petty things that like come between us. And it's like, you guys, let's get over that. Like we, we're all in a fight together, you know, like it's perpetrators against child protectors. Like that's it, you know? Um, and it's always the anti, it's always the against thing. You know, like I, even now, I, I have had to find peace with my perpetrators. So I no longer hate them. And they no longer have power because I no longer hate them. And it's some huge work to get there, but it's amazing when you do. Yeah. And so eventually there won't be division. Eventually we'll, we will go back to, to our innate human gifts that are in here, like, like, I have this thing now, which is part of my safety, is that people can be talking to me and I'll get highly confused because I'm hearing two things. And it's like, you're not actually saying what you're thinking. And then I'm talking away with someone else and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm right there, I'm right with you because they're actually speaking exactly, they're congruent. And so, you know, everyone will get back into, well, we'll be able to tell who's congruent, you know, it, because it's always been at face value. Yeah. Um, but that's actually a gift that we all have. We all have that and we can all grow that. And, um, and you know, I'm just here to say, hey, it exists and you can grow it too. <laughs> Such an important lesson, Poppy. So many important lessons today. Was there anything else that you had on your list that you wanted to talk about today? No, I think I really covered everything that I feel I feel for now. Like it, it's, it's actually been wonderful. I, I feel like I've really be better to talk about things that relieve me as well yeah because you know these perpetrators if they're carrying on then you know they also need to people need to know a little bit about that about the nature of it and that these things um through cursing and whatever can siphon energy I mean I can probably talk about energy siphoning that probably be another whole show <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's an important yeah. topic. You should come back on and we could do a show on that sometime if you want. Absolutely. I will. I will. That's a I huge really want to understand. Okay. We'll plan on that. And you really did. Yeah. You did so amazing. I can't believe that you've just, you know, that this is like the first time that you've shared your story in this way because you were very congruent. Like you were on it with being able to articulate some really hard things, you know, and these stories are not easy to get through. They're not easy to yep. 
And I just want to say that you did absolutely phenomenal and you blew my mind. And I know that people on the other side are having these aha yeah. moments and plugging the, your puzzle piece into the puzzle. Now, you know, you get to finally give back the things that people have given you to help your puzzle, you know? So congratulations for telling your story for the first <laughs> time. And you are just amazing. And I can't thank you enough for choosing, you know, my little channel to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm so, it's good to hear that you're really close to a survivor yourself and um, that you really know it. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. And I want mm. everybody to go follow you on YouTube. Is that the only, I know you said Facebook's not good to contact you. Is there any other like social media or anything that you, that you have YouTube? Okay. No, I'm going to have to do something in the future. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I'm looking at Bitchy, but I have problems with technology. And <laughs> if, if, if there was someone really, really genuine that wants to help me with that part, I would, I would. I would feel that all out and see if there was a way that I could get myself out there better. Um, yeah, because that's something I've struggled with. Oh, I hear you. Yes. it's And YouTube's tough too, because they do. Like, it's super easy and it's user-friendly to use, but it's they suppress you and, you know, put lots of barriers. And you always have yeah. to work. You're gonna I, get I've had my last it. strike on of YouTube as well. Yeah. No, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'm talking about how, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we need to get you on some other platforms, girl. I can help you too with that. So we can talk a little bit thank about you. it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you for listening. You guys, yes, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to have Poppy's YouTube channel below. Go support her. She has some really valuable videos. There's a lot of really important stuff that she's talking about in them. Um, and she gives pieces of her testimony too. So go check out her videos. Go follow her on YouTube. One of the best things that we can do is keep an eye out on these warriors as they're speaking out. You know, we need to be their army and let the enemy know that we have an eye on them, that they better not try any tricky business um, because we have their back. You know, we have to be their army. So go follow Poppy on YouTube. I'm going to have all of my uh, all my links to in the show notes. Follow me on all platforms. Never know, you know, who's going to keep me, who's going to let me go. Um Pray over us. Pray that our channels don't get, you know, deleted, terminated. Give us some good energy. Send it our way. Give Poppy all your love for coming here and sharing with you guys a testimony that she has never shared before publicly in this form. Um, please give her all your praise. Write some awesome comments below you guys on, on your biggest takeaways of this and how it impacted you. And I'm so grateful for all your support, you guys. So with that, thank you guys so much for listening. God bless you. And we will see you next time.